I have trouble making friends. I get emotional thinking about this. I'm assuming they're having the same dilemma neurotypicals are having, which is not that you can't make friends, it's that you're not being seen by your friends. I really think loneliness is about the relationship we're having with ourselves because it is so much easier to form community and to form friendships when you know why you even want them in the first place. Being lonely is not why you want friendship. Can you imagine going to somebody and saying like, can you be my friend? I'm lonely. Well, that doesn't feel good. Now that person knows they're just a placeholder for your loneliness. That's not good. That feels really icky. Um, I have friends. I do have friends, but I only have friends one at a time. Mm. Okay. I have never in my life ever truly been a part of a friend group and and I this is a myth this is a myth everybody listen to britney this is a myth the friend group is a myth it does happen for some people at certain times of their lives but it is never consistent and it is very difficult to maintain some people in some bubbles have friend groups i the neurodivergent bitch I am also thought I needed the friend group only to realize, no, no, no. All of my closest, deepest friendships are one-on-one -on -one relationships, all of them. And they all would not get along. If I put my inner circle in a group together, they would absolutely not get along because I am the thing that likes those people. They are not a group. This is a myth. I had friend groups my whole life. They always broke up. They always ended because they're not real. Like they're real for some people in some places, maybe. One of the oldest friend groups I know of is a teacher friend group, okay? She's been coworkers and friends with these people, but once retirement hit, they had to go the extra mile to make sure they still met up with people once a week. And they do make that effort, but they're also baby boomers. They're older people. So they're doing that. They don't move from their towns. They never leave. Everyone else I know growing up who had friend groups, none of them stayed. None of them stayed. So if you're going to have a friend group, that means you have to have people you consistently see, usually in a physical space, usually on a regular basis, like once a month, once a week, almost on routine. You have to do life with people. Friend groups are, in my opinion, something I had to radically accept is not what they sell you in TV. I used to think friend groups were like, how I met your mother, Seinfeld. Uh, I've had those groups of friends, guys. I've dressed up in a suit and got laser tag, you know, gone to laser tag. They broke up because people got kids. They got married. They moved on. We weren't close. We grew apart. We had different politics. We d had different hobbies. That's why I say be grateful for the moment in time they exist. Be grateful that a consciousness has come into your life to make a connection with you and who knows how long you'll be friends. Ooh, ThoughtSpot says friend group versus having a community support system. Very good distinction. I don't know how you define it, but I would say I have a community and support system, but I don't have a friend group. I have a community and support system, mom, parents, siblings, dad, friends. I don't have a friend group. I have groups of friends that I visit as the solo guest. What's up, Brittany's in town. But I do not want to be a part of your clique. I do not have the spoons to create a clique or to move with you or to raise kids with you or to see you on Saturdays, girl. All my friends have always lived in different countries than me, different states than me. I don't have luxury. Me and my best friend who've known each other since we were nine, we used to be, live next door to each other. I moved away when I was 15. And then we moved away in our, in our 20s and 30s and now we're still best friends after all these years. But she lives in the, the America. I don't live in America. I didn't think, oh, I'm not going to move to Croatia because of my friend group. Friend groups are commitments. They're very rare. Look at your life and tell me how many people have actual friend groups you want. Look at your life and name me them and then ask yourself, can you do that? Because I don't want to do it. Hi, I'm Gen and I explore issues through both sides. And I'll be moderating this middle ground episode of autistic and neurotypical. And the first prompt is, I find the word disabled offensive. Ooh, already spicy. Well, I guess I'll start off first. Um, so being on the spectrum, the autism sector myself, and being someone who masks my autism pretty well, I have a hard time accepting the fact that technically, yes, I am disabled because throughout my entire life, I've had to deal with things like sensory overload, you know, dealing with high emotions at times and stuff like that. But I also was raised to be a go-getter and to 
if I put my mind to anything, I can accomplish my goals. And so, and I have accomplished stuff. I'm a writer. I've written about being on the spectrum for Insider, The Doe, Ooh. and places like that. And I don't let my disability stop me. So it's like, you know, we live in this world where having a disability is a bad thing. And I, and most people kind of operate that way. And like, I feel like we should neutralize these words though, right? Like when you say like, I'm disabled, I don't see it as a bad thing because I, I see it as a different way to explain a challenge, but not a bad thing. So if you perpetuate the cycle of thinking, it's like reclaiming slurs. I feel like it's the same thing. Like, why are we allowing society? Like, I just don't have this association with disabled, but I want to accurately represent disabled. Oh, this is interesting. I just had an epiphany. The reason I don't want to own the word disabled is because I don't know if it's accurate with the fibro, but I don't think the word disabled means bad. It just means red or yellow or green. It just means like two hands or one hand. It just means a description. It doesn't tell you anything about that person. It doesn't tell you their morals. It doesn't tell you what they're capable of or not capable of. It doesn't mean anything. What do you guys think? Ingrid says, girl, you're disabled. I mean, I'm fine taking that label as long as it's accurate because I don't want to go. I don't like want to run around being like, oh, I have brown eyes when my eyes are hazel or like, oh, I'm black, but I'm obviously not. I'm a Syrian. So it's like, I just don't want to mislabel myself because it doesn't feel that's my like my anxiety is like on mislabeling. You know what I mean? So I just want to, if it's accurate, then I'm happy to own the title because I don't think it's bad to be disabled. I just don't want to lie and say like, oh, I'm disabled when I'm not because then I don't want to be a liar, right? Because that would make me feel bad. Discourse said facts, Brittany, if people aren't using words correctly, then just make it clear that they aren't and then proceed with your link or your usage. Too often I see people just back off or stop using words or being scared to use them because the majority doesn't know how to make zero sense. At that point, you're just agreeing to the new definition. I just don't want society to decide being disabled is bad when it doesn't mean anything. Like it just means a thing. View disabled people in a negative light. And so for me, whenever someone calls me disabled, it's definitely a trigger for me, to be honest. Yeah. Ah, fair. He's got trauma. He's got trauma around it. I would agree with exactly what you're saying. That was kind of why the reason I came up as well. Um, I feel that as a root, it's not an offensive word, but the stigma that our society has made it today. Uh -uh. Society, which society, which society, which one? has created it to be an offensive word. My, my son is nonverbal. He's never said a word, never had anything um, use communication with his uh, language. What I find the problem with disabled uh, that I've always had an issue with is it looks at my son in a way where he's supposed to be fitting into everyone else's world. Even movies that are made about autism that are supposed to be like these movies that are make everybody love autism, usually at the end of the movie they do something in everyone else's world that makes them special. Like they catch a touchdown, they, they go to prom. My son's not gonna catch a touchdown. My son's not gonna go to prom. He doesn't care about those things. And sometimes you can just be who you are and you don't have to be labeled, well, you don't do these things, so you're disabled. Can the disagreeers please? Interesting, nonverbal son, is that not disability? Interesting, maybe it's not. Are mute people disabled? I think so, right? Am I crazy? I don't know. How do we categorize them? See, I love categorization. <gasps> I love it. Step forward, please. Oh, and he made a very good point about the media thing, which is also true. Like we put up, um, I, I didn't, I used to watch Big Bang Theory, but I got really fucking annoyed with it because I just like, I, I didn't like anyone on the show. But we tolerate Sheldon's bad behavior because he's smart. And I think that's bullshit. Like we tolerate people for their weirdness or their bad behavior or even like offensive things they've done because they're smart or talented. And I think that's interesting. I don't necessarily think it's black and white, but I think that's interesting. I never read too deeply into the word disabled. It's just a descriptor of me. I'm disabled. No one's really used disabled as an insult to me, at least not in any way that I've been able to pick up on it. However, people have used the R word to me, and that mm. is what is offensive to me. Uh, disabled is just a descriptor. At the same time, though, I feel like this is a real test for the gray area here because I still somehow agree with what every single one of you just said, even though I disagree with the prompt. But everybody has their own relationship with words and terminology, and I think that that's what's so beautiful about the autism community. Mm. I. Uh find myself agreeing with what James is saying, where, you know, his son probably shouldn't have to conform to the ideas 
that the world is uh, setting in place. Like maybe. How do you guys compare this stuff to like Muslims or in Catholics or blacks versus whites? Eh, that's not a good example because that's not like a script they have to follow. Somebody that has like a script, like religion's probably the best example, even though I know some of you guys aren't religious, but like. What do you guys think about that? Because that's that's how my brain like understands like, look, if Muslims don't have to eat pork and Catholics eat pork and Jews don't eat pork, then like nobody has to be like anybody else, autistic or neurotypical or anything else. If you're like, you know what I mean? Like this neuro neurodivergency reminds me of the same thing. How can we decide like, but people say like, oh, because it's a belief, but neuro being neurotypical is more than a belief. You're born that way. Or like it's your body and brain and genetics. So it's even more of a reason to be respected. Like we respect the fuck out of religious communities that believe in gods that aren't real or proven. But like we disrespect the fuck out of people that are born a certain way. And I'm like, what are we doing? Society is so funny. It's like so backwards in some ways. Like, of course, people who are autistic shouldn't have to fucking like be neurotypical. But it's so interesting that like we make so many accommodations for people who fucking don't eat pork. Maybe he's perfectly happy uh, being nonverbal and he shouldn't be expected to talk. Well, I don't uh, know if he's completely happy being nonverbal. Do we know that? Is that an assumption we're making? Do we know that he's happy being nonverbal? That feels like a reach. Um, but at the same time, if we try and say, you know, disabilities don't exist and that everyone has to fit in this box, right, and we get rid of the term altogether, then that's kind of maybe forcing people like James's son to uh, conform to the world. Just to piggyback off of that, say, James, uh, have you told your son about this episode and has your son ever com uh, communicated uh, any degree of advocacy to you at all? I talk to him about everything. People always tell me when they find out he's nonverbal, they're like, you should talk to him. I'm like, I talk to him more than I talk to anybody else on earth. Like, it's well, constant. There's things he doesn't understand, like fundamental things that he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand that I'm going to do this. He doesn't understand what autism is. He doesn't understand things like that. But I tell him, I'm like, well, How is that not a fucking disability? See, this feels like trauma. We need a therapist. Why doesn't anyone go to therapy? Jesus Christ, why does nobody go? I'm not saying they're not going to therapy. But this is obviously trauma. He doesn't want to call his kid disabled, but the kid doesn't even understand that he has autism or that he's nonverbal or that he's on this show. What are we talking about, people? I love you with all of the compassion in my heart. Go to therapy. Go to therapy. We're going to go, we're going to talk about you. We're going to have, you know, all the great things about you. When By I the way, denying your kid's disability is denying your kid's autism. Is the same thing. My parents refuse to believe that their kids have autism or ADHD or borderline. So they can't help us when we need help because they don't see it as a problem. They just think we're quirky and that we, we can do things like everybody else can. And then when we can't, they're like, what are you doing? Why can't you do everything the way everyone else can? It feels like it's invalidating either way. It just feels like invalidate, like invalidating, invalidating, invalidating. I relate to my son. What I try to do is I try to put myself in his shoes. So I write a blog about him. I try to do autism appreciation, I call it, where I talk about the positives of autism and how he's a great kid, not despite autism, but in many ways because of autism. That makes me very happy to hear. I'd love to read your blog. Thank you. Okay. Jubilee viewers, you should read his blog. I'm <laughs> 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 my, my new hype man. Thank you. So back to the prompt. Just like what you have said, I f was one of the few people that faced the R word, especially in high school. I haven't been called disabled for for any reason to be offensive for me anyways, but I do see like how it can be debatable and questionable because it can come off as like, you're trying to say this person can't do something just because they can't think a accordingly or maybe cannot walk accordingly or can't concentrate accordingly. Do you identify or view yourself as disabled? Y yes, but I don't, I don't personally find it offensive for me because I feel like there's just uglier words, but I do respect where everyone else is coming from though. What do you think of that word disabled? Does it bother you? Disabled, um, for me, the kind of autism I have is a communication disorder. Like for example, when I was a little girl, I walked around in circles talking to myself. I wanted to join the conversation, but I didn't know how, and my brain wouldn't do what I was telling it to do. And I've had 20 years of speech therapy, 15 years of occupational therapy, to be able to talk like everyone else, to get more. Nice, Abby, killing it, girl, killing it. I am today. So you think it's okay to 
use the word disability because it helps people understand mm -hmm. how hard you've worked mm -hmm. to be in the conversation. Yes, it does. And I'm even in the therapy right now. That's true. And nice. I would agree with Abby on that. I would say that because this... Um, oh my God, Selena. Remember the Black Eyed Peas song? I just learned about this because my partner just told me this. Get reducted. Get reducted. Get reducted. Let's get stupid. Get reducted. I just learned about this. My partner just told me about this. I was shook. I was shook. I did not believe him. I was like, you're fucking dumb. That's not true. He's like, um, it's literally true. I'm like, you're so stupid. It's not true. And then we found the original. The world is different. The world is a different. The world changes. Holy crap. Abby is a legend, Bryson. Agree. Autism word and spectrum now has successful people and writers yeah. who are neurodifferent mm -hmm. and people who have had 20, to, 20 years of speech therapy. And I'm one of them. And you are. <laughs> and, and rock star over here. <laughs> but, but it's confusing. So I, I like the word disability because when we're in public and Abby has a stim or arms are flailing, you know. Yeah, and some people on the spectrum tend to rock back and forth and flop their hands. And that's a stim. Oh, why you got to call me that stem. out? I was doing that just now. <laughs> no, literally, I've been holding my hands like but this. That's just that's trying to that's that's a good thing, though. I that's even do this, or I, um, but I don't rock back and forth. Right, but that's not your stim, but other people do like that. So, <laughs> But whatever mine. that thing is, I just feel like if you understand that autism can be different, can be a disability, because I don't have to stem, I can stem. This is a stem too, mm -hmm. and uh, but it's stems. not imperative for me to do that to be in this conversation right now. I do have a question though, because our word kind of came up amongst a few of few of you guys. Mm -hmm. Is there any nuance with that in that being not offensive or offensive? No, <laughs> just straight up no. Because the thing is, we've come such a long way in terms of like, well. I don't know if a long way in terms of understanding autism. I think that's why we're all here. But, <laughs> but um, just more like, like we've gone past that word. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was, I used to work at a coffee shop and there was this guy who would never call people that word, but he- Oh, the R word? Are they now talking about the R word? Um, are they, right, they're talking about the R word? I got lost in the conversation for a moment. They're talking about the R word. Um, yeah, that word to me, it's really difficult because uh, especially as a queer person, like I've had queer people tell me not to use the word queer, but like I can't do it. My brain has no emotional connection to the word. My brain has no emotional connection to a lot of words. I only have emotional connection to people's intent with words. So maybe that's my neurodivergency as well. But like I don't care about words. I care about the intention of people's words. So if somebody even says like, if somebody said, I love you with bad intentions, I would be just as upset if somebody said that in a slur. So the way people feel about slurs, I feel about the way people say words with intention. So I've noticed with my brain, I can understand why slurs are offensive. I definitely agree. Like I could see that. But my brain doesn't seem to have any emotional connectivity to words in general. It's always the intention. So if somebody says, I love you, but I like... Like, that's a nice thing to say to somebody, unless it's not. Then it's like, what's happening? So, like, I I seem to have that connection to words. I don't know if that's very common. It doesn't seem to be very common. Or it does seem to be very common in my circles, but not necessarily in the world, which is why the world gets, like, very offended about things, because words mean things to people. And words do mean things to me, but it's it's not even the word. It's really the intent. You know, Bryson says the Kardashians know how to say I love you in a mean way. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Says, yep, yep. All about intent for real. Maddox says, yeah, same. I see it. But personally, the intent of it really, if it is, oh my God, Brittany, the intent, intent. And if it really is directed at me, then I have issues. Yeah. It's like, like, okay. One time my sister and I, I this is so long ago, God, this was like years ago. We were like snipping at each other as sisters and then, you know, we say like all these kinds of words to each other all the time, like C word and B word. And we're just like casual. One day I said it to her for like real. Where I was like, you're being a C word, bro. I don't want to say it. It gets me demonetized. You're being a C word, bro. And she was like, what? And I was like, yeah. And she was like, oh my God, we're like fighting. And like, 
It's different. Context matters. Tone matters. Intention matters. Even saying I love you can be like the worst thing you've ever heard in the world from somebody. Saying you look pretty. Oh, you look pretty. Oh, wow. You really tried today. Wow. That's actually a pretty like color of lipstick today. You know, it's like, what's happening? You know, so again, I don't mind words, but I really care about the intent. I think the thing that's scary is when you can't read someone's intent and you can't tell if they're making fun of you, if they hate you, if they're dangerous to you. That's what's scary is like, am I sitting in a room full of people saying it as a bad thing or a good thing? And it's that confusion that I think makes people fearful. And then people say, well, the solution is to never say the words. But we can't keep doing that because like, I mean, we can and we'll just cycle out new words like dumb and stupid also used to mean our word. And now our, you know what I'm saying? So our word is probably going to be normal in another 50 years. In another 50 years, like Gen Z or Gen Alpha, probably Gen Alpha and the one after Gen Alpha is probably going to bring it back because it doesn't matter. What matters is who's saying it and how is it being said? Oh my God, Bryson, I'm praying for you in a passive aggressive tone, girl girl he just would say like oh that's the, the r word like that's that like whatever he was kind of like one of those people that was kind of like well it's just a word and it's just a word i'm like well there are several other english words <laughs> to yeah. use so it's just like i don't really see the like the medical field has gotten past it mm -hmm. we should get yeah. past it the, so year, it's the just, year is not 1940 right. and at this point in today's modern language it is really an insult um especially going to a public high school i hear Yes, Thought Spot in the chat. Let's go. Thought Spot in the chat. It's our girl. Context and intention is so important. Hard agree. We obviously want to be kind to people. We obviously, but then when we want to be mean, we want to be mean. But no, we obviously want to be kind to people. Um, so I can absolutely understand why words mean things to people. I I do agree with that. I just don't seem to have an emotional connection as much as I do to the energy behind the words for that a lot yeah yes yeah. i have trouble making friends can the greers step up no not pink shirt pink shirt has a hard time making friends honestly lots of people in the bdsm community look like him and they hang out in coffee shops and honestly i'm here for it or nerdy gay communities or theater communities <clears throat> I get emotional thinking about this. Um, I still am struggling, especially, Aiden. especially now. Um, it just feels like everyone is, you know, it, it, it may, I'd never had any friends until third grade. I only talked about Pokemon with him and. Okay, see, we need to get him into the right Pokemon group. If you love Pokemon, there's no way we can't find you friends. That was it, and he was probably likely also on the spectrum, and I was so severely bullied at my public elementary school. Yeah. Girls tended to be nicer to me, uh, as opposed to boys. Uh, Abby doesn't have friends? What the fuck is happening? I'm so pissed. I can't tell. I'm assuming they're having the same dilemma neurotypicals are having, which is, it's not that you can't make friends, it's that you're not being seen by your friends. You know what I mean? Thought, pot, thought Spot said I made a two-hour reaction to this motherfucking video. Bro, I'm going to watch it, bro. I'm going to watch it, bro. I'll watch it on my own time because I love, I would love to hear your thoughts on this video. I would love to hear your thoughts on this video, girl. I am so going to watch that after stream. I'm so going to watch that. Please. Um, I see eye to eye. Yeah, I have a lot of trauma that I'm working through um, regarding bullying. And that way, I find it harder to talk to men even today for that mm. reason. I... I, I'm lonely. I'm, I'm so lonely. <laughs> I really think the loneliness pandemic, like I wanted to, I really think loneliness is about the relationship we're having with ourselves really truly because it is so much easier to form community and to form friendships when you know why you even want them in the first place. Being lonely is not why you want friendship. It's not, it's shallow guys. Can you imagine going to somebody and saying like, can you be my friend? I'm lonely. Well, that doesn't feel good. Well, now that person knows they're just a placeholder for your loneliness. That's not good. That feels really icky. 
That doesn't feel nice. Who the fuck wants to be a placeholder for your feelings, bro? So instead, we have to know why do we want friends? And it can't be because I'm lonely. It's not nice. That's not nice to do to people, bro. Okay, so then you say, well, I want friends so I can play Pokemon with them. Cool. Let's go to a Pokemon event. Okay. Now, I want friends who also want to talk about philosophy. Okay. Well, join Brittany's Discord. Okay. I want friends who want to get to know me and my family. Okay. That is going to be a little tougher because now we have to be in the same place. Now we have to socialize out like in the home or outside the home, but like in, in physical proximity. Okay. And then it has to be somebody that wants to get a little bit more intimate. Okay. That's going to be a little tougher. How do I meet people that want to get to know me and my family? That's, oops, sorry. That is tough. Okay. So then we have to go down the thing. Well, how do we do that? And then it depends on the individual I'm talking to, right? So again, when people say like, I'm lonely, they're saying like, I don't have a relationship with my consciousness. That's my theory. And then when you say, even though I have a relationship with my consciousness, I'm feeling kind of uh, alone today. I'd like to socialize. Okay. Where do you want that stimulation to come from? Where do you want that social to come from? And why do you want it? You know what I mean? I, I really, I, I channel all of it into my music. I channel every aspect of my loneliness and trying to understand other people and trying to connect with other people in my music and my songwriting. Uh, Thank you, Maddox, for the shout out of the Discord. Appreciate that. It is my coping mechanism and uh, I just try and keep myself busy uh, to uh, cope with the fact that I've really, really struggled to make friends. Coping is such a good band-aid, but it definitely is not a solution, right? Um, when I was a little girl. Oh, Sage, interesting. I feel lonely in my life and my life purpose is connection. What kind of connection? If you don't mind answering, what is the goal of the connection? What do you want to come from it? If connection is your life purpose, you shouldn't feel very lonely because you should be able to connect in little ways with just about anybody by saying hi to somebody. Saying hi to somebody is a connection. So I, I would like want to dive deeper into that. What, obviously, you don't mean just like a connection. Like we're having a connection right now. Hi, Sage. Hi. We're having a connection right now. So you don't mean that, right? Because otherwise you wouldn't feel lonely. So what do you mean when you say, I want to make a connection? Because if you're saying a deep and profound connection, well, that's a super rare thing. And to make that your life purpose means that your life purpose is from the outside and not the inside. So that's a really difficult decision to make that your life purpose, right? Something that can only be fulfilled by other people and not from yourself. Life was very, very hard. I didn't have any friends. I couldn't, I wanted to join the conversation, but I couldn't because my brain wouldn't do what I was telling it to do. And for in high school, I This is why I think the consciousness and the brain are different. Because <clears throat> Abby, Abby is, I think the brain and the consciousness is different. Because Abby said, I couldn't get my brain to do what I was telling it to do. Yeah, exactly. The voice that's telling your brain to do something, that's your consciousness. And then your brain is the machine that works or doesn't work today. So when I'm having like a neurodivergent, like overstimulation breakdown, and I'm sitting on the couch and I'm like, get up, Brittany, get up, move body, do something. You're fine. Do it, do something. And my body's just like, mm, no, I'm like, oh my God, you bitch. And I was like, okay. Like I'm there, I'm trapped inside of my body and I'm screaming at it to move. That's my consciousness. And I'm like, go move arm, move brain. Like my brain is moving things, but it won't work. It won't work, you know? Ugh, it's so annoying, you know? Sat alone at lunch and I had didn't really have any friends until I didn't start making friends till I was like 17 or 18. Same here. Somewhere around Same there. Here. And Truly. because I've all, that's why I've always wanted to be an adult because I knew I'd have more language. It'll be easy for me to communicate and life would be, life in general would, would have been easier. I actually can relate with Aiden to an extent. I, I had a difficult time making friends because, well, at the time when I was younger, of course, I didn't know I had autism, but I was also a little bit different. I was those autistic kids who, kind of was a social butterfly at the time. So 
believe it or not, aside from how I appear, I was such an extrovert. I was mm. being seen in middle school as kind of like a class clown. And then by like high school, the first high school I went to, which was a really bad school, I was put the little, the gay stigma because of my voice. Because all the guys there, their voices are more like, low like this. <laughs> but mine, but at the time I was like, more high like this. But it was hard and by the other high school, which I spent the rest of my high school years, I made a little bitty friends, but people mm. who actually did not just disregard me and did not see me as like a walking joke or some potential lost cause, because a lot of them was really enough afraid of me of what I can do, so. Well, I would like to chime in in case it were to, okay, never mind. In a, in a sec. Um, Man, over, like, what a moment. Beautiful. Um, Thoughtspot says, guys, if you don't know the Thoughtspot's content, you have got to go check her out. She makes great videos. Says, we don't talk about extroversion within autism enough. Yeah, it's very difficult. I struggle with extroversion, introversion. I really, I think we all struggle with those defin like those words sometimes. Um, because like even recently someone was like, oh, you're shut a sh you're a shut in, Brittany. I was like, I'm not a shut in, bro. I just don't want to leave the house because like they're different things to me. Um, I also like, I don't get, I get very overwhelmed in big crowds. I get overstimulated and I don't want to fucking do it. And I get exhausted. But when I was younger, I was always putting myself in social situations. I was always forcing myself out of the house. I was always like trying to find myself. So everyone was like, Brittany's so extroverted. Brittany loves loud music and big crowds. No, Brittany was doing those things to find herself. And once I found myself, I could isolate because I, I didn't need it anymore. Um, so for my brain that's, it's hard for me to decide, like, are you introverted or extroverted? I'm so extroverted, like, even on the big five, my extroversion is so high. Um, but my actions mimic what people think an introvert does. Like, I don't want to leave the house. I don't want to leave. I don't want to dress, like, I want to stay home. I want one-on-one -on -one attention. I don't want group activities as much as possible. I'm not a team player. Like, all of those things. So it's it's hard to, you know... Sage, continuing the conversation about connection, says, I mean connection of all kinds, but because I value connection, when I feel an absence of deeper friendships, I can get lonely. It doesn't mean that I don't enjoy my time. I just miss the presence. Okay, fair. When I think of loneliness versus like, okay, when I think of loneliness, I think of like a really, a feeling of despair and not being seen or not being connected or understood and it hasn't happened to me in years because I don't associate it anymore with like social activity or talking to people. So because I used to think my loneliness could was going to be it was about other people, but I actually like found my loneliness was about myself. So I'm curious when you guys but I do feel sometimes like uh, bored, which I transfer to being um, not literally bored. Um. Okay, hold on. When I say like, oh my God, I'm bored right now. What I'm saying is, oh, I miss social connection. So I call my sister or I call somebody or I go outside. But I don't get bored in my actual life. Like if I'm, I don't get bored because there's so many things I want to do with myself. But the only time I feel like, oh, I say like, oh, I'm kind of bored. I'm going to call my sister is what I'm, what I'm actually saying is like, oh, I'm kind of like, I want to bounce this idea off of somebody and I want it to be that particular person. But even that feeling is really rare for me at this point. But okay, so what I'm trying to say is like, is it loneliness, like a feeling of despair? Or is it more of a, oh, I need to socialize. Because like socializing is really normal. We want socialization. We like talking to people. Or slash feeding, getting a symbiotic relationship. So are you guys saying lonely, like that feeling of despair? Or are you just saying like, oh, I need to socialize. I miss people. I want to like hang out. Somebody go to dinner with me. You know what I mean? Because, like, when I'm thinking of, like, he's lonely, bro. Aiden is lonely, bro. He's lonely in a significant way. You know? I haven't felt that way in, like, years. Because, again, I had to go through that introspective journey. I wish I could take Aiden and be like, how do we not? How do we not contextualize loneliness in regards to other people? Because social opportunities are absolutely everywhere all across the globe. You know what I mean? So, you know, ooh, Tiger says, I don't think my loneliness is about 
anything. It's more circumstantial there. Good example. Uh, yeah. Well, now I don't remember. <laughs> uh, well, no, I do. Um, I have friends. I do have friends. But I only have friends one at a time. Mm. Okay. I have never in my life ever truly been a part of a friend group. And, and I This is a myth. This is a myth. Everybody listen to Brittany. This is a myth. The friend group is a myth. It does happen for some people at certain times of their lives, but it is never consistent and it is very difficult to maintain. Some people in some bubbles have friend groups. I, the neurodivergent bitch I am, also thought I needed the friend group only to realize, no, no, no. All of my closest, deepest friendships are one-on-one -on -one relationships, all of them. And they all would not get along. If I put my inner circle in a group together, they would absolutely not get along. Because I am the thing that likes those people. They are not a group. This is a myth. I had friend groups my whole life. They always broke up. They always ended. Because they're not real. Like they're real for some people in some places, maybe. One of the oldest friend groups I know of is a teacher friend group, okay? She's been co-workers and friends with these people, but once retirement hit, they had to go the extra mile to make sure they still met up with people once a week. And they do make that effort, but they're also baby boomers. They're older people. So they're doing that. They don't move from their towns. They never leave. Everyone else I know growing up who had friend groups, none of them stayed. None of them stayed. So if you're going to have a friend group, that means you have to have people you consistently see, usually in a physical space, usually on a regular basis, like once a month, once a week, almost on routine. You have to do life with people. Friend groups are, in my opinion, something I had to radically accept is not what they sell you in TV. I used to think friend groups were like, how I met your mother, Seinfeld. I've had those groups of friends, guys. I've dressed up in a suit and got laser tag, you know, gone to laser tag. They broke up because people got kids. They got married. They moved on. We weren't close. We grew apart. We had different politics. We had different hobbies. Having a friend group is the mythos. My parents don't have friend groups. They have friends that sometimes get together as a group. The friend group is a is is true for some people but it is not true for a lot of people i would say even most people e think about the people that only see their friends because of the super bowl it just happened this weekend right but they didn't see their friends outside of that think about the people who only see their friends on holidays that's not the friend group everyone's talking about so yes people have friend groups but whether or not those friend groups stay forever that's why I say be grateful for the moment in time they exist. Be grateful that a consciousness has come into your life to make a connection with you. And who knows how long you'll be friends? Who knows how long the connection will stand? Who knows? Right? Like who knows? Ooh, ThoughtSpot says friend group versus having a community support system. Very good distinction. I don't know how you define it, but I would say I have a community and support system, but I don't have a friend group. I have a community and support system, mom, parents, siblings, dad, friends. I don't have a friend group. I have groups of friends that I visit as the solo guest. What's up? Brittany's in town. Blah, blah, blah. But I do not want to be a part of your clique. I do not have the spoons to create a clique or to move with you or to raise kids with you or to see you on Saturdays, girl. All my friends have always lived in different countries than me, different states than me. I don't have luxury. Me and my best friend who've known each other since we were nine. We used to be, live next door to each other. I moved away when I was 15. And then we moved away in our in our 20s and 30s. And now we're still best friends after all these years. But she lives in the, the America. I don't live in America. I didn't think, oh, I'm not going to move to Croatia because of my friend group. Friend groups are commitments. They're very rare. Look at your life and tell me how many people have actual friend groups you want. Look at your life and name me them and then ask yourself, can you do that? Because I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. So again, you can have the friend group. Some people have them. But look at the people in your life who have real people, not TV shows. Look at real people 
see what they have and ask yourself, do I want that? And what do I have to do to get it? Because I don't want to do it. I'm not interested. God bless. I love you. No. And it doesn't mean I'm rejecting you. I've had to explain to some groups of friends, I'm not rejecting you. I just literally don't want to leave my house today. I love you. I don't want to leave my house today. Thank you. Thank you. You know, um, Discord says I have a friend from my past who was trying to make a, f- a friend group of several of us. See, awkward. Um, wait, that's so funny. Some of us who I uh, used to hang out in college, but we've all changed so much. It's very awkward. Stop. That is so funny. That is so funny. Stop. That's great. Ooh, thought spot says companionship versus support. Companionship meaning like a partner and support meaning like family. What are you saying? Tell me. You know? Tell me. Oh, yes, Miss Fishy. And not just real people, but people who are respectful, understand boundaries, and don't enforce click group think. Yes. Sage says, for me, it was my everything. But to be honest, it was very codependent. It, it kind of has to be in nature. That's what I'm saying. Group kind of has to be codependent, which is why I don't like it, right? This has been something I'm working on. I love that. But that's the problem I found. I liked the idea of having friend groups. And then I realized like, oh, this kind of codependent. Mm, nah, I don't like it. Nope. I don't like it. And then people expect things of you and they get angry at you. Like they, I'm already neurodivergent and fibromyalgia tired enough. I don't need a group of people that expect me to do a potluck once a week, girl. Ma'am, that was the dream when I was a kid, girl, but I have a new dream now. May I own a meditation spa and spend my time breathing solo away from people. (laughs) And I have some of the most beautiful friendships ever. And they're so quality because it's just me and that I'm glad Aiden said this because I'm sure he does have friends. And I wish you could, Aiden, I wish you could hear me. The friend group is a myth. One friend, but. Especially for neurodivergent people. Girl, we do not have time for this. Man, I just, I just wish I could be a part of a group. I was out in public recently. I saw four artsy looking people that were about my age and they were they all hate each other there's cheating and lying and they're all absolutely talking shit about each other don't forget that all these friend groups might be toxic as fuck but from the outside look fun as fuck the toxicity in the city is so real don't fucking convince yourself that these group of people are living a life that is amazing and perfect because if you ever hear about all who's fucking each other the drama the drama okay Okay, look at YouTube. YouTube isn't even a physical friend space in the drama. Over what? Friend groups? Overrated. I said what I said. All talking and having a blast, and I was just looking at them just like... When the am jealousy I gonna, when, kicks in. <laughs> yeah, when, when am I going to have that? That's what I wanted to add. That's you can move sure. on now. Mm-hmm. It's funny because I disagreed. I was the only one on my side who disagreed, but I also can pinpoint each and like each of you in something that you said because I definitely can relate. I think I've gotten good at developing surface level friendships. As an adult, I still don't really know how to find that line between like opening myself up but also not expecting the same in return from the other person because sometimes they don't know how to give the same in return. So it's just it, like it's not just necessarily like that the other person has bad intentions it's just the way we communicate and the way that we the connection they don't see parts of themselves in each other to have the symbiotic relationship i'm not exaggerating when i say when i have a vibe with someone i'm like ooh we're vibing but i know we're becoming friends on like a specific thing i'm like cool and i'm not going to you know make a thing of it i'm not going to think okay we'll know each other i'm just letting it be what it is but i'm like okay it's like kind of casual, but let's see if we can get it to go deeper. And it's always dependent on how symbiotic can it be? How do you connect? What's the vibe? What do you have in common? What language do you use that's the same? It's like, do we get along? And it's like, are you bad because we don't get along? No, it's not bad. It's only bad. Like none of these people seem bad. They all seem really nice and good energy, but that doesn't mean it's going to be a vibe every day. And everyone has different needs as well. Everyone has different needs as well. What is your needs? How much friendship do you need? Like, how do you define closeness? Oh my gosh, so many things go into this. So again, 
my th- my theory is pick a thing about you. Why do you want friends? And what do you need and how close do you need to be that person to get that thing? And is it symbiotic? Make sure you're both winning, not like just in an exchange way, but literally in a, oh my gosh, we both want this way. Like we're enthusiastically excited to like, yes, vibes, but also don't overstep boundaries and be okay with limitations, you know? Because I think that's where friends get, I've noticed this. It happened recently in the YouTube sphere. It's happened in my own personal life. Friends forget you're not doing life with them. And they start acting like they're your boyfriend, expecting you to be places, expecting you to tell them what's going on in your life, expecting, I'm not dating you, bitch. No. And I think friends do become entitled to your intimacy because you've been intimate. I'm intimate with my friends emotionally, vulnerably. And because you've been intimate with your friends, sometimes they assume they're owed that intimacy as life changes and they forget like we're not dating. There's got to be a boundary with my friends. I don't want to tell my friends everything. Like I, as I make new friends, I always tell them, I don't want to tell you about my family. I don't want to tell you my family's names. I don't want to tell you about my husband. I just want to talk about me because like I'm not here to like bring new people into my family circle. I'm already closed, but I want to make new friends about work, new friends about life, new friends about me as an individual. But some people, sometimes friends, they forget they're not dating you. Okay. We think can be different and just not always work. And I think that's still something I'm struggling with. Even here, like hearing you guys over there when I was disagreeing, the level of openness that you're willing to share these stories is like, it's what we always say we want. Like as a parent, you go, I want to have a, I want to have a kid who's, who's, you know, uh, honest and who doesn't lie and who doesn't do these things. And then I'm like, he has autism, like, oh, I'm like, no, but that's exactly what we all want, right? We want that, <laughs> that thing. And they don't get it. And I've, I've struggled with my son. My son is not, I mean, social was always, in my opinion, like out the window for him. He's not very, like, he doesn't want to socialize, hang out with people. But what ended up happening was my girlfriend's son is minimally verbal. And he's known him since he was like three years old. Oh. And whenever we would get together, he would always like try to play with my son. And, and Lucas was just kind of like, whatever. And we noticed about a year ago, they were in the pool and like Lucas started like following him around the pool, trying to like tag him. I was like, oh my God, is this happening? And we've noticed slowly that he's been doing that too. I see that, I, I worried about him having, you know, people be his friend. I worry about people taking advantage of him. I worry about neurotypical people sometimes having the worst in- <laughs> intentions. These people who, who don't have disabilities are the ones who sometimes do some of the cruelest and worst mm-hmm. things. So it's always been, True. I'm not so worried about him and friends, I'm worried about the other people around him to be his friends sometimes a little more. As far as developing friendships, it's ironic because I'm insanely social. Like I traveled Europe by myself with a backpack and oh. I'm still friendly with people I met for a week on a train wow. in Venice. When Abby was, um, as she told you, a little kid, she almost didn't see them. It's it like all, I didn't see them. It was like other kids, she just walked right past them. She was so in her own world, which is her kind of autism. And so, can I explain the whole Ariel story? Um, you can, sure. And not? when I was a little kid, when I first saw the... I love Ariel, too. She's my Disney princess. Oh, wait, I almost sang Aladdin. Oh, my God, kill me. I almost sang Aladdin. Ugh, Abby is going to be so disappointed in me. I just failed the Disney moment. I'm going to cry. Don't tell Papa Gut and Mama Gut. They're Disney fans. Don't tell Abby. I just fucked that up. Oh, my God. We, we Walt Disney's The Little Mermaid. I really... Un- Stop perceiving me. I'm just... <laughs> understood Ariel and she she inspired me she, Ariel was my inspiration because True. it's just like how where she wanted to be with the humans and I wanted to be with the neurotypical people just like that and when Ariel became human she couldn't talk that's how I felt mm. that's exactly the kind of autism I have too Abby <gasps> I have looked out on someone for being autistic just my chat <laughs> just you guys <laughs> I'll sit next to you why not <laughs> um yeah I mean, I have. I mean, I'm not proud of it. Because I was diagnosed around three or four years old, and my parents got me intervention very early. Because of that, I was able to get coping skills and learn how to mask and learn how to essentially be like everyone else. I'm at a weird point. Like, the last couple years, I've really have come to realize that, like, the mask I've had to put on has really been kind of like cemented onto my face. (laughs) And like my autistic self is like something I'm still trying to chip away at. Like when I was younger, like I was never the one to bully anyone, but like I would take note of like other kids who I felt like were autistic, like whether they stemmed 
noticeably or not. And I kind of subconsciously would just sort of be like, well, I can mask. Why can't you mm. keep it together for, for lack of a better? Very common thought. Very common to think, well, I can do it. Why can't you do it? Okay. I run into this. You run into this. It's just a thought we have as people. Or way of saying it. And I'm certainly not proud of it. And it's something that I definitely am working towards correcting about myself. But for me to say that I haven't done that would be a lie, which is why I'm, <laughs> which is why I'm sitting here. I never really spoke or never looked down on those on the spectrum. And this was obviously before I found out I was autistic because I was diagnosed at two. And then I later found out by like, I think middle school year, but I never looked down on them because in the end of the day, for me anyways, they're human and mm. let alone, aside from me. Uh, we look down on humans though in general. I think that's a really interesting idea to never like have looked down on anyone your whole life. Like, do you look down on Trump voters? Do you look down on racists? Like a lot of people do. If he doesn't, that's kind of interesting. Like he's saying, um, like I've never looked down on anyone. That might be a true experience he's having. Maybe. Isn't that interesting though? I think looking down on people is just like, an ego thing, you know what I mean? You're like, oh, I'm better than you, ah, eh. <laughs> you know? The autistic, I am also can be looked down because I'm, as you all see, I'm alternative and stuff, so <laughs> <laughs> there's just no- oh, Sweet bean. Point, for me anyways, to look down- I'm commenting on the alternative thing. It's true, alt, for sure, alt. You know, it just, I love it. Now on someone that's on a spectrum or anyone who is, who's with special needs, or has any other disabilities that they may not have asked for anyways. From the information I've gathered, the four of us who are on the spectrum were all diagnosed very early. Mm -hmm. I would be very, very curious mm -hmm. to know uh, somebody, somebody who was diagnosed much later's perspective on that, especially since- Great point. Since for so many of these later diagnosed people, they don't realize they're on the spectrum immediately. I've sat at parties with Asperger kids, which I know you're not supposed to say that word, but the intelligence in an Asperger person is such a gift. Uh, uh, and um, I learned all about astronomy from this one kid in two hours. And his mother nice. was saying, oh, leave, her, leave the nice lady alone. And I was like, no, please let him stay with me. This is so cool. So because, that's because I'm- <clears throat> Interesting. <laughs> is, um, I'm confused now. Isn't Asperger's just the name for autism that we used to use, but like a Nazi was using it. So we're like, eh, fuck the Nazi. Cause we're looking down on him. See how I connected that. So is Asperger's different? Like, are you like super intelligent when you have Asperger's? What? That's not a thing. Is that why Elon Musk says he has Asperger's? Well, how about this? Uh, I'm not, I don't know how you feel about this sentence. I don't know. I'm a little confused now. Am I wrong? Cause somebody educate me. Um, also I like Abby's mom. A bunch of people were not happy with her in this episode, but it's probably just because she's talking. I don't know why she's here. If the, why is the mom in this? Why isn't she, is she, why is she here? I like her. I'm not saying anything bad about it, but like, why is she here? You know what I mean? Like, what was the point of having her here? Cause other people's parents aren't here. So do they just want another parent in the crowd or did Abby? Oh, I bet Abby requested her. I'm dumb. Abby probably requested her. I'm coming from that place of looking at neurodiversity, autism, Asperger's in, in a different way because I've been around it for 25 years. I'm a teacher's aide for the beginning theater class at my school. And there are a few, quite a few kids in the class with autism. Sometimes those- I'm sorry, how's this girl neurotypical? Just say something that's a little crazy or a little out there. Something <laughs> that, like some other kid might take offense to it, but I just know like, sometimes there's no filter, like it's okay. And I'm just like, okay, like let's talk. That's the neurotypical? This one? Talk about why that might not work, why that not might not be a thing to say, or if it's something that's like, whatever, we can just move past it. So yeah, definitely like no judgment at all. Like I understand that sometimes uh, there's like less of a filter or something else like that. So both of my parents are special education preschool teachers. Um, they've bounced around throughout the grade levels. But when I was in preschool, I went. Oh, Ingrid says Asperger's is equivalent to level one ASD. Okay, so it's like, Selena says 
Uh, I think Asperger's is used to describe one end of the spectrum. Oh, interesting. Went to the same campus that they did, and I was in a class where myself and then later my sister were the only two neurotypical kids. Mm -hmm. um, everyone else there either had autism, Asperger's, or some sort of physical disability. Mm -hmm. It's not something where I would look down on a person for having that just because I've been around it so long. But I know that, um, like we were talking about, public high schools mm -hmm. and kids in general can be really cruel. And it's not uncommon to see uh, autism or the R word being thrown around as an insult. And yes. it, it happens on social media all the time, especially TikTok. Unfortunately. TikTok is like a war ground, a battleground for like the rudest, meanest, most judgmental people. And sadly, a percentage of them say they are on the spectrum. Prior to my son being diagnosed, I remember one of the things that worried me was that as a parent, when you first have a baby, um, two things. One, Jake Hudson, thank you for the raid. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, raiders. Welcome. Second thing is I do think a lot of the people, the mean autists, I think mean autists, you know, like edgy boys on Reddit who have autism and are like, you're our word. You're in our word. I think they, to be fair, are also fighting the stigma that they can't handle it because there is a stigma growing up if you're neurodivergent and sensitive that you can't handle anything. So they learn to handle it and they become really, really mean. And I will say, like I said, I'm not very connected to words. So I don't think the word is inherently wrong. I don't, I don't believe any word is inherently wrong. I think like context matters so much. So for me, I do think the mean autist boys will use the R word and other words to feel like they're tough and they don't have to censor themselves because they're not like sensitive, but they're actually the most sensitive because if you like literally insult them or question their intelligence, they're like <laughs> fedora, you know what I'm saying? So I feel like ultimately we are all insecure in different ways. And then how that we express that insecurity just is a different flavor. So some people are mean, some people are extra sensitive, some people are withdrawn, some people are, you know what I mean? Baby. Autism is almost treated like something you have to avoid. Like it was, it's almost like, be careful. Don't like, don't feed him this. Don't do this. Don't tell him that. <laughs> and then when he had autism, I was like, okay, now what? And they're all like, and I'm like, but what is, what does it mean? Nobody can tell me what it meant. Nobody told me what it looked like. I mean, he smiles. He hugs me. They're like, some people hug. Is well, he gonna talk? Maybe. I'm like, you're not gonna tell me anything. What am I gonna find out about him? So I was preconditioned to be fearful of this thing that once I saw how it affected our lives personally, it wasn't. Bad, you know, it was one of those things where like I was expecting the worst possible situation. I think a lot of times people have opinions on something that they don't know anything about. What I actually just realized is one of the key defining moments was actually like remembering I was having a hard time socializing in middle school. I remember I remember Senior. one commercial <laughs> yeah, me too. from Autism Speaks. It was like the black plague was among us and just talking about an autism. It's like autism. <laughs> Did Abby just go? <gasps> Cause he said the F word. Oh, Abby, is this past Abby? Does future, does past Abby realize future Abby about to say the F word every two seconds? Oh, I love that. And was basically treated like this. I wonder if her, what's up with Abby and the F word? I'm assuming her mom probably didn't have her say the F word because she might not know when to say it or something. And now she gets to say it cause she's an adult. Was this the moment Abby got to say the F word? Cause Abby just reacted. First. <laughs> And or maybe it was the autism speaks that made her say something. You know, it's gonna creep on you when you're least expecting it and everything. Like, and I remember that commercial vividly. And it's just like, what kind of message are you sending out to the whole world? Mm. Even saying like, are you acoustic? I just think that's so funny. And I don't know why I think it's funny. It's just because I've imagined an acoustic guitar and I'm like, N -n 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 <laughs> I just think it's kind of funny. I think everything is sort of funny though. Like words, I just think words make me giggle. So I kind of like, um, yeah, I don't know. When I hear people say like, oh my God, are you acoustic? Or like, are you autistic? I'm just like, nee, 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 nee. like it's just funny to me. Oh my God, I don't know why it's so funny. It's like hearing people say fuck. Sometimes it's just funny. You know, I don't know why it's so funny to my brain, but I just, I also don't take anything like personal. You know, what does acoustic mean? It's just like the internet slang for autistic. I don't know where it originates from, but it makes me laugh and I don't know why. It's just so funny. Acoustic. Like, it's just, it's kind of, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. World who does, who won't take the time to educate themselves yeah. on things. And I'm I think so happy that Autism Speaks has really stepped up their game in recent years since then. Accommodations should be made for autistic people to be included in society. <gasps> 
gosh. Pink shirt didn't move. Aiden didn't wor- move. Oh my God. Aiden. Something that I've written oh. about quite a bit and why I have felt like I've had to write about my autistic experiences a lot as an adult is because there are no services really for adults. <laughs> and I, that's mm-hmm. a problem. At least like besides like ther- speech therapies and stuff like that. I mean, in terms of like for me learning how to be social, it was something I had to learn on my own. And like, I know that other autistic people unfortunately will struggle with substance abuse and alcoholism and stuff like that because you know putting on the mask can be so exhausting (laughs) you just kind of like don't know what else to do taking thc for me has helped really kind of learn helped me learn how to about my autism actually which is sounds like such a stoner thing i don't consider myself a stoner but just you know i don't think they'll stop oh my god literally my response to thought spot says Wait, who said, who said the thing? Oh, Bella says, I saw someone calling Grimes that and I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> I don't know. And look, not everyone has the same lived experience. So super valid. But yeah, in in my, I don't know. And I'm just like a little, I don't know what I am. But like, I, yeah, I just think words are funny. Like, I just think it's so funny, dude. I don't know. What is it? Like, what is it? Oh my gosh. The clip of Theo Vaughn calling, uh, oh my God, that f- clip is so funny. Uh, uh, trig- trigonometry, the podcast with the two guys, Theo Vaughn calling them autistic, bro. I snort laughed. It was so funny. He's like, ah, okay. <laughs> it was so funny. I don't know. I fucking love it, bro. I love, I love it. Oh, it's like finding like a Pokemon. There's an autist, and it's like a Pokemon. Here's Pikachu. I don't know. It's great. I fucking love it. But I also don't think there's anything wrong with being autistic. So that probably helps. Like, I just don't think it's, oh, that's the one thing about the debate space with the bros that I don't always love is instead of being like, oh, cool, you're autistic. Like, that just means like, that doesn't mean anything about your ability to speak or not understand things. Like, again, I don't think people who have autism struggle any more or less with understanding people so much as they don't understand the bullshit of the metagames that neurotypicals play and honestly me neither but also like neurotypicals misunderstand people all the time all these people on the internet that are like oh britney is so weird britney doesn't understand anything maybe you're the fucking autist since you're the one not understanding or maybe you're the neurotypical who's also not understanding somebody's not understanding girl is it really the autists or is it just people in general misunderstanding each other all the time? You know what I'm saying? I just feel like. Mm, mm. Those are concrete things like, you know, and I, I do think that Hi, the Jake. medical industry, in part by updating their understanding and updating terminology, I do think that there needs to be more. What are some specific accommodations you would like to see? I don't know if I can think of specific accommodations, but I think just again, just like this overall misunderstanding of autism really as cliche as it is i mean it really just affects every Mm. it's kind of like adhd and time blindness i love that there are certain jobs that are like it doesn't matter when you get your job done as long as you get it done in the next 24 hours like how time accommodating is that for adhd people who have time blindness i think that's just so lovely um (coughs) excuse me i feel like they're like again my theory won't ever work because people are lazy but if we could play to everyone's strengths I think we could move them into the right jobs and the right communities for them to thrive, but we are not taught to play to our strengths. We are taught to play to the strength of society, but I don't know who society is, right? Because society like is so diverse amongst the globe. So I think that's one of the dilemmas I'm going to have is when we say we need organizations or programs, I would say we need to play to people's strengths. So not everyone can do the same thing, which is why I hate when men and women are fighting and they're like, what women wants to work on an oil rig? I was like, well, if women were in charge, we would just create a world where we didn't have to. Okay. Like, or we would like trade something. And that's the point. It's not that people don't want to do something. It's like, it wouldn't play to our strength as women. Men play to their strength. And they're like, why won't women um, do the jobs we want to do? You don't even want to do those jobs, bro. And also no one's forcing to you. Most men are never doing those jobs anyways. It's a minority job. So it's like, we need to play to our strengths, but we don't have a society that's built that way. And also some people are just assholes. Just a reminder that we're seeing nice people but some people out here are just mean. They're bad at their jobs. They're predators. They're horrible people. Whether they're neurotypical or they're autistic or they're neurodivergent in any capacity, just a reminder, the society also doesn't run 
and help every community because society isn't always run by well-intentioned people or we're not always well-intentioned people in our communities. We all have somebody in our family, if you have a big family, who's the moocher, who takes advantage of people, who lies about everybody, who who like lives with their parents because they refuse to actually help. And we'll like, I know people who've drained money from their own parents, who've stolen money from their own parents. I know people that have like effed over their own families. Who needs enemies when you have a family like this? Hello? You know? So again, like, I think we have to remember that all society is complex because not everybody in society is just like this, like, happy person who wants to just do good and make art, bro. Like, some people be out here trying to make havoc. With the grape statistics being what it is, someone in your family and friend group is out here being a predator, bro. So again, that's why society's issues, like, good luck, kids. Good luck. We a single autistic person. Well, the problem is that autism manifests itself in so many unique ways. Right. And yes. it can differ yeah. so much True. from person to person. Right. That, you know, the moment that you're out of the public school system, right, uh, mm -hmm. they stop providing an aid, right? And yeah. Exactly. Yeah, navigating life yourself like that is probably really difficult. Um, it's difficult for a typical person coming out of high school in this day and age with the pressures and social media in your face. I see it with her brother. It is so hard, I think, for a Abby has a brother. Wait, did we know that? Did we know that? Did we know that Abby had a brother? Wait, did we know that in season one? Why don't I remember that? Wait, maybe I do. Shadow B says, what level of stealing from their parents? Like, drain them of all their savings in retirement. Like left their parents destitute. People be crazy. People be mentally ill, bro. People be crazy, you know? But also not everybody's a good parent. Lots of bad parents in the world, guys, who don't raise like functional adults. Just the truth. A lot of people, let alone someone, and then the parents of the person who just turned 18 trying to help their kid build a life. Yeah, with no support. No support, it's, it takes a lot of fight. I'm a fighter, so I speak from that. I've been there, done that. I have cried more hours on the phone trying to get accommodations and programs going for her after 18 than I did when she was a, a younger kid. Not to mention colleges are one of the few places that Mm. has a piss poor reputation. I'm not saying all universities and colleges, but most of them has a piss poor reputation for not having appropriate accommodations, but not just for, for, for kids on spectrum, but I mean, other kids, whether they're neurotypical, but they are have special oh, education. Absolutely. It could be overstimulating. Yeah, they can sure. be overstimulating because mm. when you're out of high school and you're trying to figure out what you want to do, especially with college, and, and you try to get them your IEP, it, I mean, sorry, IEP, <laughs> It feels like you're going under because I'm trying so hard to scream, I need assistance, but it's like they still won't hear me. I'm in a new college, I'm gonna be attending that one soon, but the other one that I finished my AA in, they made a, a big reputation for not taking appropriate matters when dealing with people with IEPs or that really does need help, even if they're not on the spectrum. Well, congrats let's, on your AA. Let's hear from the- Okay, hold on, I wanna say, one of the most difficult things for me in navigating school was just like finding classrooms. That shit gives me so much anxiety. I think I'm mostly, I mean, I've been taking notes with the obviously anxiety and depression and stuff. Though I haven't been depressed in years, my anxiety is always through the roof, bro. Riddled with anxiety, bro. Finding classrooms on college campuses before I dropped out or even high school, I just wanted to die. I just wanted to die. I was homeschooled my whole life. And then going to public school, I'm just like, I hate this. I hated it. I felt bad just asking people for like directions to my class. Like I just, oh, I fucking, I hate it now. When I'm going to a doctor appointment and I got to find a doctor's office in a big building full of all these doors. I'm like, oh my God, why? Thank you. Disagree. <laughs> All right, just to be clear, I do not disagree with any of you. <laughs> <laughs> but I do disagree with the prompt. Because oh. obviously people on the spectrum need accommodations. I had an IEP growing up. Yes, I feel I like I often mm -hmm. need accommodations all the time. But I really am hopeful that we can get to a point where we won't uh, need accommodations to be included in society. Hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I like we should like for example, Best Buddies, an organization. 
they, they say it firsthand, they exist to not exist. Mm -hmm. They're doing these amazing services for including disabled people, but ultimately the goal is for that to not happen. Mm -hmm. Just a reminder that Boogie is disabled and nobody wants to hang out with Boogie. Boogie's a great example of a disabled person that's like, I need accommodations. I need accommodations. He's the most privileged disabled person who has a lot of opportunity to get better, but won't. Think about every YouTuber you know who won't go to therapy, who actually won't get better. And remember that these people are also like a part of your society. So the reason I don't give a fuck about society, I'm like, no, because there are parts of society that are fucking, they don't know. But the people that are genuinely like ready to change or they're ready to make that decision, like those are very different people. And I think those are the people we should be focusing on. And then when those other people change their minds, like they can come to. It's not like Boogie is like rejected forever, but he can't join the group if he's going to take everyone's resources and be an energy vampire. Okay. And again, like not that I'm a big fan of group activities, but you know what I mean? So I kind of like where Aiden's going with this. Like society should just be, that's okay. That's maybe my dream. Maybe that's idealistic. I don't know. I'll let him speak because maybe I'm misunderstanding. But I do kind of feel like it would be nice if society didn't have accommodations. That society was just like considerate ahead of time. Like when you're, okay, when I was a nanny, I had the same realization that like wheelchair users have when I was like walking the babies in Seattle and sidewalks didn't have ramps. And I'm like, what are you doing? Why are we, why aren't we updating our sidewalks? Put ramps on the sidewalks. Like it's already hard enough with a stroller, but now somebody on a wheelchair is going to have to fucking hop a curb. Like they're fucking skateboarding. Like what's going on? So obviously my brain is like, it's not an accommodation. It's just thoughtfulness. Like an accommodation sounds like doing something special, but think about how efficient it would be. Again, I love efficiency. How more efficient would it be just to have ramps on your sidewalks? For everybody, for skateboarders and bicyclists, for everybody, not just people with disabilities, not just for people with accommodations, for people, just people. But we don't think like that. And then we get resentful because we're like, oh, you're asking for more. It's like we're asking for efficiency, but humans are not as efficient. They're pretty efficient for an animal species. They are on a macro. They're pretty efficient. But on the micro, I do think we're not as efficient all the time as we think we could be. And I think, I, I'm sure everyone's just overwhelmed and overstimulated, but dude, something as simple as that, ramps on sidewalks, my bros. Trust me, worth the investment. Yeah. I always try to be respectful of everybody else. Like if we are at a loud restaurant and he's yelling at a loud restaurant, everyone's yelling. You can yell at a loud, but if we're at a library, if we're at a recital or something, I take him outside. Mm -hmm. So because of that, there's things we can't do. But in the last few years, we've been going to, like on Broadway, they'll have autism friendly presentations. We saw the Rockettes, we saw the nice. Nutcracker. Mm -hmm. And it was so great to not only be able to do that with him and let him be able to see that and be a part of it and to not stand out, but on top of it too, people who, are affected by autism differently than my son. To see them given like, you know, fidget toys and these squeeze, I'm like, this is such a, a beautiful thing. And I think sometimes when we talk about accommodations, a lot of people who are neurotypical see it as, okay, what are you gonna do to my thing now to make it easier for somebody else? And what I'm saying is, you don't necessarily have to change what you're doing, but maybe make something that my son can go to as well, where if he's not gonna interfere with what you're doing, that kind of a thing. That's how I saw it when I, when I sat down for it. Yeah, just like different options. We want different options for different people. Just because you were talking about Broadway shows, I know the show How to Dance in Ohio, which is <gasps> I about- I just saw it. I love uh, how, I really saw want, how to Dance in Ohio. I really want to go York. see it. It was great. Um, but I think, if I remember correctly, I think they do have like a sensory room. They, they do, they mm -hmm. have a sensory yeah. room. They, they have, have everything. Have, spinners so they have all kinds of stuff that's cool. uh, accommodated and the performers are on the spectrum so. right and so like with that i think we can normalize things like that i was on american idol this past season i did um oh, well <laughs> 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 and i i told them straight up um in order for me to be my most optimal self in or and in order for me to be my best self i'll need some of these accommodations i'll need you i understand that you know, schedules are a bit loose when it comes to, you know, entertainment industry related stuff. But if you can just give me some degree of a little push, you know, as to giving me some sort of ETA for this, that, and the other, and they were great. They were great. I had a wonderful experience on American Idol for that reason. I was the only non-minor there who had his mom with him 
during that time. Um, and I'm proud to admit that. I'm a mama's boy. <laughs> no, no, but... What do you think about that? Do you think like the fact that he's the only person with his mom there is because he has autism or is autistic or no, he just like likes his mom there? Because honestly, I like to bring my mom places too. Autistic people are not accurately represented in the media. <laughs> Let's go people. <sighs> I have so many thoughts about so this. <laughs> it's okay. Obviously, I'm a white autistic male, and a lot of like the mainstream representation are quote unquote like super intelligent white autistic males. But that's all there really is. And for me, I'm not like Sean on The Good Doctor. I think we've definitely made some good progress with certain things. But I just remember growing up, it was always like superficial stereotype. And I just would love to see. I mean, that's just so everybody, right? Nobody, like it's rare for groups to feel like they're ever represented, but even more than that, it's really hard for individuals to feel like I'm represented, you know? And I think that's what's so difficult. Um, interesting, one time I was dating a white guy and he goes, I, you know, I'm just getting like really annoyed with all these like, um, he didn't say it quite like this, but like minorities begging for like representation. He goes, what does it matter? Just enjoy the movie. And I was like, well, I feel like it'd be nice to see yourself on screen. And we were talking. Then we went and saw this movie. And after the movie, he was like, man, that was amazing. That was like, I felt like I saw myself on screen and it just felt so good. He's like, I want to see more movies like that. And I like looked at him and I was like, yeah, like that's exactly how minorities feel. And he was like, oh, and I was like, yeah, that's exactly the feeling. You feel ostracized, you don't feel represented, you finally see yourself in media and you're like, oh, I wanna see more of that. Yeah, that's what they're asking for. And he was like, oh, but he just like couldn't understand it until it happened to him. Some people learn that way. Some people only learn by doing and experiencing and then some people learn from observing. Everyone's different. I think I learned a little bit of both, but mostly I learned through doing. I learn a little bit through observing, but mostly it's also through doing. But it's interesting the way we learn, right? But I'm not sure that anyone ever feels really represented because there's 8 billion people on the planet in case anyone forgot, you know? Oh my God, thank you, ThoughtSpot. Doing the Lord's work. Look at me doing, doing the Lord's work, you know? The autism represented in a way that's more nuanced with like particularly with women like not all autistic women are Temple Grandin. <laughs> and oh, as brilliant her. as she is, as brilliant as she is, but that's not, that the problem is they wanna take these like pillars and just kind of think that like, these are the only options. It's either like the worst. Wait, someone in my Discord shared that meme, like uh, when you realize you got the stuffed animal autism and not the science and math autism, it's something like that. That shit cracks me up, bro. That shit's so funny. Cause like, look, it doesn't matter which kind of whatever you have. It doesn't matter what kind of wo woman you are or guy you are or black you are or white. You it doesn't even fucking matter in terms of that stuff. What matters is like, who are you as a consciousness and all of the diversity within you as a consciousness? And how are you like experiencing life? This very short life we have. It's so short. And then we die. You know, it's like, what is that about? That's such a like a more profound question. Ultimately, even talking about like wanting representation in media is the, it's still just aesthetic. It's still just shallow. It's fun and it's good, but it's still shallow. But it's also like society's version of depth. Society as a group, their idea of depth is seeing themselves on the screen. I think true profound relationship with the consciousness is something that could never be shown on a screen. It only can be shown in parts, loosely, and then you put it together. But could, could a representation on screen ever truly encompass the lived experience of a consciousness, especially when you know all those biopics always change the facts, girl? So the worst are the best of the best, and that's not fair, and it's no, not true. No, that's so true. You know, I wanna see an autistic character where their autism isn't necessarily like their whole story. I have some friends who think that, and I think this is probably kind of- Hmm. If you told a story where their autism isn't their whole story, would that mean like you don't know they have, like they're autistic until the very end and they're like, autism. 
You know what I mean? Like I love a label. I love a, I like I love a diagnosis. I love knowing myself more. I love knowing that my favorite color is X or this is the thing I love or this is the thing that I I love all of that, right? Um but I'm not sure like ultimately any of that isn't just still superficial in some capacity, but also it's 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 just another ingredient i think in the soup ultimately i don't know prevalent if you say they have autism they're either they have savant syndrome right where they're just a genius and they can there's no way ben shapiro doesn't have autism i refuse to believe he's not autistic i refuse to believe thoughts about so curious to see how you respond to when abby's mom voices the need for autistic stereotypes hey let's see i mean that stereotype is someone's life so just a reminder stereotypes are based off somebody and somebody has that life but also a stereotype is kind of like saying the average. Like there's no one person that is the stereotype and there's no one person that is the average. But like we are okay with stereotypes because we stereotype the people we don't like all the time. We all do it. Everyone knows the stereotype of a, name your group that you don't like, a red pill guy. What's the stereotype of a red pill guy? We know that stereotype, but it's a stereotype. Right. We know the stereotype of a very specific kind of person. And I would argue that stereotype is the superficial for something that is incredibly profound, which is your categorization. So, you know, I like to be categorized. I think there is a type of person that people either fit into or don't like. But that stereotype is only known within the bubble. So when we say like, oh, this is white people activity, that's a stereotype. When people say like, oh, I bet I know who did this thing. That's a stereotype. Oh my gosh. Can you believe, of course it was a, that, you know what I'm saying? Magically uh, do something perfectly like play piano. Um, yes. Or they're a person who has really low functioning autism and, you know, they can't do much. You know, they need able people to help them. It's oh. Is that going to piss anyone on the panel off? Molly says, I feel like sometimes it takes media representat representation for someone to realize they deserve a place in the world. I agree. I think it's a tool. Absolutely. Media representation is a tool for some people to find their place in the bubbles and in their life. Absolutely. As is um, any kind of validation from home or understanding of self. I read as a kid. I've read thousands of books. And absolutely, I was looking for myself in these books. Absolutely, I was looking for myself. I'm like, is this me? Is this me? Is this me? And I'm like looking for who I am in the story, right? So I, I do think that's really reasonable. I think sometimes... Um, again, it's weirder, you know, it's different with books in a way, because there's so many books in the world, like movies could never contend with how many books there are in terms of representation. So I feel like with movies, you have to ask someone to make a movie for you, but the weirdos who already wanted their representation in their books have written those stories. So I feel like there's a book for everybody, but not everybody likes to read or can read. And so you're, the medium isn't as consumable as a movie seems to be for some people, which is interesting because I do think representation exists. I just don't think you need to find it in a movie. But people really like movies and it's easy. And it's, like I said, it's accessible, you know. It's unfortunate that that's kind of the two stories that are being pushed. And um, you might have aphantasia or you might not be able to imagine things. So like, I get it. Um, and there's not a lot of nuance there. And right. people assume uh, the worst or the best and they don't look at it the other way. So my thing is I wish that this, the term spectrum keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it, what it doesn't do is honor the individual skill sets. Right. Like you have an incredible skill set. You just got your AA, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> you know, and, and your son sounds amazing and loving and sweet and you know what that is because you spend all your time with him. And, and this charm right here, it's amazing. <laughs> but, but what bothers me the most mm -hmm. is that in the media, like TikTok, for example, I guess oh. it's trending to be autistic. Oh. And I oh. Interesting. Interesting. Uh oh. It's I'm very worried be, about this. Yeah. It's trending. Magic with Thomas. Well, well, what I'd like to say is if you have sensory issues, you're now called autistic. I grew up with a brother who had sensory issues. He is not autistic. But now you're clumped in with that. Mm -hmm. So then what is. Well, it was always a construct. You know, Dr. Kirk Honda really popped my bubble in this regard. Oh, my God. I haven't watched Dr. Kirk in so long. I've been, like, off TV shows. I got to catch back up with him. 
like on his content. But he said like so much of what we're doing here is a construct of taking things together, putting it in a bubble and saying that's that that thing. So I think there's something we have to acknowledge, which is as far as I know, even with autism or borderline or with all like sometimes it's like. So I'm curious, like, what is the diagnostic criteria? Because some people, how do you feel about this? Some people go to therapists for their diagnoses. Some people go to psychiatrists. Some people go to like MDs. How do you feel about people getting tested for autism? Or how do you feel about self-diagnosis? Right? I know I think, again, like I answered earlier, I'm okay with other people self-diagnosing. I just feel like with, like for some reason, I have no problem thinking I'm dyslexic and be like, I'm probably dyslexic. That makes sense. Or I'm just calcula. That makes sense. But for some reason, self-diagnosing as ADHD or autism feels like too big of a change probably because my life would change. Mm, that's probably why I don't want to diagnose myself. I want to get an official diagnosis and either hear that I am or not because my life would probably change. My life changed around my fibro diagnosis. My life changed around my borderline diagnosis. I feel like with ADHD and autism, my life would change around that because I would be like, okay, those places where I felt like I was behind or failing, now that I have an understanding of what I'm doing wrong, I'm going to change my behavior to be more efficient. So that's probably why I don't want to self-diagnose myself because I will change the way that I live my life. Mm, that makes sense. I just had a bubble pop of my own. Thank you. I had an epiphany. Thank you. There's the representation. If there's literally not three levels, but 50 levels yeah. of functioning. 50 levels of it's, functioning? Yeah, it's, it's confusing. Right, like, like on TikTok, you'll see like someone with 8 million followers on TikTok who's in a comedian who's the funniest person ever and who I'm an amazing fan of is, is looking for an autism diagnosis at 35 with a college degree and two kids. And you go, oh, I wonder what that is for them because did you have any speech therapy? This is why I say parents need therapy. People need therapy. Autistic, like everybody needs therapy. Because this is a wound people have, which is, I was able to do it, why can't you do it? Or it was very hard for me, and if it's not as hard for you, you don't have the thing I have. You don't understand my pain. You know, sometimes people will come on my videos and they'll say, Brittany, you have no idea what it's like to be bored. Like, I'll be talking about Trisha or something. And they'll be like, you have no idea what it's like to have borderline. You're misunderstanding, Trisha. You don't get it. Like, unless you have borderline, you won't get it. Diagnosed 2017, baby. DBT, baby. So sometimes I think what the mom is so, and I so have compassion for this, is saying, is like, I can't imagine this man who's so successful is struggling because that's the same reaction my parents would have, except they won't acknowledge the diagnosis, even if my sibling and my other sibling have ADHD and autism, they don't see it because they're too functional. Because they don't see all the tiny quirks. They don't see the breakdowns. They don't acknowledge any of those things as autism or ADHD. They see them more as like something else. Kayla says, do you think you couldn't change those things if you had a diagnosis? What would you change? Having a set way that's recommended, I get different labels by every expert. This made me realize I'm fundamentally the same either way. Do you think you couldn't change those things if you had a diagnosis? Can you reword the question? I think the reason, okay, I don't know how to tackle a problem unless I know what my goal is. So if I don't have a diagnosis for something, then there's no goal for me to shoot for. So if I... So that's why my brain needs an understanding of like what I'm tackling. Um, like I don't, I won't do a school assignment unless I know what the point is. Like I won't even answer a question. I'm like, what's the point? Of, like this, what's the point of the question? I'm trying to understand the question. Like I don't get the point of the question. Like I meant if you did not have a diagnosis. Well, I don't know what I need to change. So I don't know what's going on. So if I, if I, like I noticed the fibro makes me work at like 70% of my normal self, the normal self that is now dead and doesn't exist. But I'm also like struggling with certain things like um, focus, overstimulating. I'm stimming all the fucking time. And it's so weird and disruptive that I'm like, okay, what's going on? Hello. What's this, Brittany? What is this? I'm just like, things are changing, but I don't know how, what needs to be changed. You know, Kayla says, so like if you just thought I needed better organization for an example. Yeah, I don't think that's the I don't think it's something that I can solve on my own because I've already tried to solve it on my own. But I don't know what the problem is. Like, I don't know what's missing, you know. Like, I've already problem solved enough on my own that I'm like, I need a professional. 
don't know what the problem is. Same thing when I got diagnosed with borderline. I thought I just had depression and anxiety because that's what I had. And then I was like, something's wrong. I'm already doing all the things. It's not right. Something's wrong. And then I got diagnosed with borderline and my life completely transformed. And I'm so better. But like I just – I need the right the right thing to tackle. Livy says, I think Abby's mom is saying this is especially upsetting because there are lots of trauma around autism speaks. Mom stereotype. And she may give those vibes to some people. Ooh, maybe. Discord says she sounds resentful because her kid is more autistic than those people. Well, I think it, I think there are always going to be a group of people that brag about being unique and different. They're like, I have autism. I have borderline. I'm queer. It's like, yeah, there's always going to be those people. Fuck them. But there's a real lived experience of people. You know what I mean? <clears throat> that... You get to a certain age, like I am at 34, 35, and you go, holy fuck, do I need to get diagnosed? Because I'm fucking struggling and I don't know what the fuck is going on. So many people on TikTok I see, I'm like, you obviously have autism, bro. You're obviously autistic. And they're like, oh, I just got diagnosed. I had no idea. And I'm like, that's why I'm worried. Do I look like those people? Guys, I'm literally, I can't view myself. I literally see people on TikTok. I'm like, obviously you have autism, bro. And then they're like, I just got diagnosed with autism. I had no idea. And I'm like, holy fuck, do I look like that? And then you guys, some of you say you do. Some of you say, yeah, Brittany, you obviously have autism. And I'm like, <sighs> but then I don't want to own the wrong diagnosis because then I don't want to be the people that Abby's mom is talking about, the people who aren't and think they are. Do you get what I'm saying? I don't want to be those people because, yeah, that kind of pisses me off. But Abby's mom, like, that's, I get it. Abby's mom is making, I don't want to be those people. That's why I don't want to self-diagnose because I don't want to be that person. And then who takes on a burden I don't have, you know? And that's the problem. It's like, I don't want to do that. But it, it, because it, it feels icky. It feels like, especially in a community where I'm a public figure. So now I'm speaking or I'm representing like, oh, that sucks. You know, I don't want to misrepresent. Like, who wants to come out as autistic and then find out you're not? Like, ooh, that sounds, like, hard. I'm just saying, like, you know, I have, like, a lot of anxiety over incorrectly, like, labeling things. I'll go to a professional. They will tell me. And I'll make sure they get it right. That's the other thing. Is like, what if they're just lazy and they diagnose me? And they're like, no! I want you to really know if I have it so I can know what to do next. Anyway, see? I have so much anxiety in my chest. I can't, I don't know how people self-diagnose. I don't have it in me. I don't have it in me. I'm so sorry. Um, and also, I'm heavily masking right now. If it's clear, like I'm thinking about it conscientiously. Don't do certain things. Don't say certain things. Don't do your tics. Don't stim. Don't do these. I do certain things I allow myself to do. I give myself a list of things I'm allowed to do on camera and a list of things I'm not allowed to do on camera. And I think you guys will know what I mean by that. But like, I feel like there are things I just like don't do in public. And then when I get home, I just like vomit it all out. So like that's why like I always have this deep anxiety before I stream and then this like I'm so happy I stream when I do but then I get home and I just want to like. Whew. So yeah I don't know but like that's the other thing do I go to the doctor and completely unmask and then they diagnose me or do I like mask harder which then they misdiagnose me on that like when I'm in public I mask the hardest obviously and I don't stim and I like sit still and I'm just like. But when the cameras are off and it's just my husband and me, I'm doing all kinds of things that make him go, huh, look at you. And I'm like, I know. It's complicated. It's a complicated thing. So I understand Abby's mom. Oh, my God, to get back to it and get it off me. I understand Abby's mom. It's very difficult. But to be honest, and she's going to have a hard time understanding this, just like every boomer, autism is a spectrum. And everything looks different to everyone. Borderlines don't experience borderlines the same. We're not the same. Everyone's different. So you might not realize until two kids and a great career, holy fuck, I might be autistic. And honestly, kind of nice to see people get diagnosed later in life. Because it'd make a lot of sense for a lot of our childhoods. Looking at our parents, we're like, huh, you know, my childhood makes a lot more sense now. We, what is it and why do you feel you need that diagnosis? But that media attention is what's, is what's permeating the rest of people who are not familiar with autism thinking, oh, I, have, I don't like loud noises. I hate the sun. I must too be autistic. And that's a, that's a worry for me. I'm, I'm curious. Do you think? Interesting. Nocturnal Wolf says, 
you know what you have. All my mental illnesses I first self-diagnosed and was confirmed by professionals. You know what you have. I don't agree with that. You would have to have the knowledge they even exist in the first place. That is not my lived experience because you would have to know what an what OCD is to even self-diagnose. What do you mean? You would have to know what it is. So no, that's not my lived experience. That actually gives me a lot of anxiety, but I'm glad that was your lived experience. That's really nice. Just another weirdo says that's lived, their lived experience too. I think that's really great, but I just don't think that's, you don't know what you have. Like you, you don't even know what the options are. What if I have something I've never heard of before? You know what I mean? So my brain doesn't like that either. See, my brain rejects that a lot. It doesn't like it at all. It actually like almost like is angry about it, but not literally just because it's like impossible because you could have something you've never heard of by doing research. No. No, no, you're way too confident in your skills. I'm not that, I'm not the confident. You do research and it's always like you have cancer. I'm not a fucking doctor. I'm not. And so no, I'm not gonna self-diagnose myself like that. I don't, I don't, mm -mm, no. Mm -mm. When I self-diagnosed, you know, even for a minute, I thought I had lupus. That was wrong. Even my doctors were wrong. You know what I mean? So I just think like, yeah, I don't agree with you, but I agree with your journey. If that was your journey, that's good. But yeah, I can't relate to that at all. <clears throat> that media representation, could you see it like in a positive light in the sense that now people are wanting to identify with it because they've seen the positive traits of autism? I, I don't, there's something positive going on with it being, I use the word trendy, but I will tell you, if I didn't have people that attack me on social media, for helping Abby to get her, what do we say? What's our sentence? To get your brain? To do what I'm telling it to do, of course. Right, to get her brain to do what she's I telling don't like it to the do. Haters. I know. But there's some really mean people, and it's because I'm helping the her. The haters are ugly, and the haters are extremely overweight. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Abby with the fat phobia, let's go. <laughs> That's so, quite an insult. Oh, yeah. Now, why don't you tell them why is that? You said that because you're thinking in categories. Because I think in categories. This Me too, Abby. This is the way my mind works, and I wrote a song about it. Right. So that's, but that is part of what we're dealing with. I also think in categories. Relatable. Oh, that's so funny. Ooh, good description, Abby. Good observation. To be in the conversation <laughs> right here, right now. In media, there's the gender stereotypes, there's the racial stereotypes, <sighs> and people are saying, oh. <clears throat> oh, fuck, that's funny. Mila with the memberships, let's go. Well, welcome, welcome. We love to see it. Oh, I love to see it. Oh, fuck, that's so funny. Woo! Kayla says online tests can be pretty accurate. The test I, uh, as the certain PD, I don't know what PD, I may get it soon it's weird because the framing i disagree the thoughts and behaviors are like me interesting i've taken the online autist tests i'm not autistic according to all those tests mm. <laughs> take that autist deniers i'm just kidding autist pushers oh abby's so funny though i will say this is normal everyone resents it look new queers get uh bored of old queers old queers resent new queers because it's like your life is easy and you don't know what we went through and then buck angel comes out and he goes i'm a transsexual and then everyone's like it's transgender now and then everyone's like oh in my day it was this everyone's just competing with their trauma <clears throat> everyone is just competing with their own trauma guys go to therapy for fuck's sake okay everyone is different it's a planet of eight billion people you think you know, it's just like it's a planet of 8 billion people, guys. Oh, my God. Excuse me. There's going to be a variation. Okay. I just think like, yeah. Okay. Just. Mm. We need to fight the stereotypes. <clears throat> but everyone's okay with the stereotypes about autism happening. And there obviously is a small group of people <laughs> trying to fight those. But there's not as big of a realm of, oh, we need to fight the racial stereotypes. We need to fight the gender stereotypes as there is for the rest. Okay, once again, <laughs> I totally agree with everybody. Um, but the reason why I stayed back is because I can't lie here. I really do feel like I have been represented quite well. Oh. But I think the reason for that is you I, are am the the representation. I am the stereotype. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, blonde boy. I was diagnosed as a child. I, you know, I was in my own world. I, I, was, I was in my own world too. Yeah, I was considered 
you know, gifted with my, you know, piano skills and perfect pitch as a child. A lot of <gasps> me people too. called me a prodigy so as a child. I. So I fit that stereotype. Another reason why I stayed back is because I think we're headed in a better direction. For example, How to Dance in Ohio. Um, there is another series I watched just recently. It was a, a British series. Heartbreak uh, High, the character I mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah, no. There, there, there are some great stuff out there. Uh, my personal favorite, Disney Pixar's Loop. I think you, yes. I think you would really enjoy yeah. it because it features a non-speaking character and it's played by a non-speaking person. Oh, yeah. You should definitely check it out. Do you yeah. think it's offensive when someone who is neurotypical plays a character that is autistic? Yes. Hmm. That was one thing I was trying to bring up, especially. At, where Veronica yeah I don't have this in me either this connection to like needing people to play accurate things like I also to be fair I genuinely might not be the great person at like talking about this because I do enjoy it when I see it well but to be honest I just don't think I've been watching anime for so long at this point like I've just completely switched off people I don't know, guys. I don't know what's going on with normal movies. I have no idea what's in the theaters. I have no idea what's going on at award shows. I've completely left the movie bubble, completely left TV show bubble. Like, other than Netflix drama shows, like, Netflix is basically my only connection to media. But I, I, I'm just so behind on everything. I'm, like, so behind. And I know everyone's been begging me to watch certain things. I just, like, I can't. Um, mostly because I think I get the best representation of people through anime right now. I'm very satisfied with anime representation. I think it's very egalitarian. I think it's very philosophy. I think they have all different kinds of races and ethnicities and body types and disabilities. Like I just think anime is so weirdly diverse if you watch enough anime obviously if you just watch the basic ones that you know i don't know what to fucking tell you but like there's so many different ways to like consume or see yourself in media from gay trans like so much positive so much real representation and you're not like a monolith where like oh everyone's always a good guy or a bad guy you get a mix of both it's really really good you know not all women are dumb and not all women are smart and not all men are dumb and not all it's just really great but regular TV just feels so dissatisfactory to me. And again, I think we have to learn to choose mediums that are better for us. Maybe TV is not your thing. Maybe read a book. Maybe grab a comic. Maybe check out some anime. Like maybe the story is being told. It's just not being told in America. Maybe the story is being told somewhere else around the world. I think sometimes, especially Americans, and we just like, settle for whatever our country has given us but like the world is a globe and it has all kinds of media representation like my parents are always saying like america isn't modest enough in their films i'm gonna introduce korean films to my parents i think they would like k-dramas i think my parents would like it they don't like as much reading which is the dilemma but they don't mind watching dub so i was like i should introduce my parents to k-dramas because they're really modest they're like really wholesome not all of them, obviously. <laughs> Alicia's, anyway. Um, so, again, maybe it's just, maybe there is representation. It's just maybe it's not coming from America, you know? Monica was bringing up about the more inclusive, basically inclusive appropriation. I do feel like it's so offensive with someone that's neurotypical to portray someone that's autistic. Like, Sia did that with um, with a little girl who was of not on the spectrum and she had a lot of backlash for that. And I see what they're trying to do, but they don't think about why not someone that can understand it, especially for the fact- But it's not a monolith. So even if you get someone autistic to play an autistic person, what if they don't represent the other autists? Like, you know what I'm saying? Just like, um, it's just at the end of the day, like you're not gonna be able to represent all people, but you might get closer, which so therefore might be a good idea, you know? This is something that's not temporary. This is permanent. Something that's kind of important is that in the media, a lot we see characters with autism, their entire character development is either learning to cope with autism or learning to mask autism. Uh, and it's not often something where it's like yourself, where it's like you, uh, your story is learning music, right? And becoming a teacher. And that's such a more wholesome story than a person <laughs> who's basically uh, learning to suppress themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just gonna, I think the reason why I have such a pushback against The Good Doctor and Atypical is because being, I've, I went to drama school, I've surrounded myself with industry professionals who are not autistic. I know the intent. And I just, in my opinion, they're doing it for money. 
I'm sorry. I just, I'm sorry. I just, it's selfish. It's greedy. And no matter even if some. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the dilemma, right? Ultimately, it kind of is about money. Even if they think they're doing the, the right thing, because they're relying most of the time on stereotypes, they're push, they're continuing to push. Are stereotypes the general? Do you think we rely on stereotypes because it's the most relatable to everyone's expectation when going into a movie? And that's why it's difficult because when you're the minority and you want a different representation, it also doesn't map on to how the majority feels about you. What's that called in movie making um, tragedy porn? Where like you 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 write movies that are like oh, sad and wholesome about somebody who like got in a car accident and is in a wheelchair and they're like really grumpy, but then they get this like helper and they like change each other's life. And it's like I think people just want like trauma porn or they want like tragedy porn or they want to like watch a movie that makes them feel like really emotionally moved and then go back to their regular life but like when you're a certain type of disabled or minority or whatever the it's just your life so i don't know um livy says i think the acting crazy and autistic as someone that never experienced it is more offensive than not every person feels represented by it mm. k says what matters is the message if a neurotypical person can act as a specific autistic character better than an autistic person then it just makes sense to go with that one they can get the job done that can get the job done well i think it's a combination of things right i i think the world is imperfect and i think we're trying to do group activities in a very like there's a very, there's a lot of complications that happen with group activities. And it's just true. I've worked with so many people, autistic people, who don't fit in with autistic groups. They always get kicked out, men. They're men. And they always struggle with getting along. Or they're super sexual or very inappropriate. Or like, they just like blurt things out. I'm like, Shh, no talking. And like, they can't help it. They're just like, mm. and I can't tell. Is that their personality or their autism? I can't even tell. But they're just like, dude, and I'm like, bro, like, and I can see it. They're very, like, it's very grating. And so you're like sitting there like, and they're like, they want to be a part of theater groups. They want to be a part of clubs or they want to be a part of groups. They can't fucking vibe with the group, dude. Now, none of the people I'm describing remind me of any of the people on this panel. So I think that's the most difficult part too, is like, I wonder if, I don't know. I don't really feel, I don't know. I don't care also. That's the problem. I've given up on the world trying to tell accurate stories. They never do anyways, guys. I don't know why we sit here and think they do. Name me 10 accurate stories we've ever told. We can't even get histories correct. We literally, when we make biography films in the US, we change stuff. We add in a weird scene. We add in a child that never existed. We add in a drama that never happened. You know what I mean? Like nothing is real. The point is representation doesn't exist, okay? If you get good representation, it's just because you feel represented, but somebody else doesn't. So I, I also don't believe in the idea of good representation anymore because it just means if you think there is good representation, it just means it represented you. That's what good representation means. It doesn't mean anything because you can't represent autistic people perfectly. They're not a monolith. You can't represent black people. They're, a, they're not a monolith. You know, somebody, okay, so if you feel like, oh, that was good representation, cool. That means you feel like it was, okay. I'm getting tired. I'm so sorry. Hold on. It's 1.30 a.m. So I feel like instead, and again, moving to anime, which I kind of like better, you're looking for characteristics of a person in people that represent how you feel more than their body or their skin color or their orientation. It's more like the person, the consciousness which is a little bit deeper of a, an ask from people because people just want to do the first thing. I get it. I used to be a queer person desiring queer representation, but there's a better part of the journey. And that's looking for something a little bit more profound past the physical and into what kind of a person is this? The character. I relate a lot to Luffy. Oh, really? I'm more of a Zoro type. Actually, I actually think I'm a chopper. Actually, Usopp be looking pretty good right now, actually. It's like, okay, actually, I feel me, not me. It's like, okay, it's their character that I'm relating to, not their gender, not what they look like. That's why I get really excited when like opposite gender or opposite race people or opposite something are into characters. They're like, I feel like that. Because what they're saying is I feel like that consciousness, not the vessel that's holding them, but the consciousness. And that's pretty cool.
push the narrative that we are not um, just one monolith. And for me, that really bothers me. And in no way am I shape or form no, trying no, to No, no, and like, I totally downplay. agree with that too. I, 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 I think it's better that I just, people I on just the get, spectrum. Yeah. I just get angry That could be said it. for anything though. Yeah. It's like, I, I, think, I think when like, I feel the yeah, same way about like company. LGBTQ films exactly. with straight guys who try to like pander and be all, you know, clearly, you know, they're playing gay characters to win an Oscar. I mean, I look, I think of gay Saltburn. Those, yeah. yeah, gay for pay. Yeah. I think media as a whole is superficial. 90% of the time, there's like some deep movies, deep shows, yeah. things like that. But the reason why they only deal with how they deal with their autism or where they got their autism from and not something deeper like your story is because they don't tell those stories. They just tell you the quickest thing they could tell you. That's why I was so honored to be on American Idol. Mm -hmm. I, I, I am very, very happy with how they portrayed me. Uh, they even included my meltdown in there as well. Wow. It was, it was very raw and they didn't skew it. I, I can truly say that, you know, so I'm, I, th that's another reason why I say I think we're headed in the direct, right direction because I'm a firsthand lived example of that. Last point. And then you, you were talking about how, oh, LGBTQ films or actors of different races, and there's not that much happening with actors without autism um, representing characters with autism. Mm -hmm. That's there. That's just because there's not enough movies being made about that. Like you saw Sia's music, and there was tons of backlash against that. But there hasn't been that much ba backlash in recent films because there just aren't enough films being which made. Which is ironic because Sia actually came out last year and said that she was di she had diagnosed with autism, which yeah. is a whole other ball game that intrigues me. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs> I just, I, I had to throw a lot of writing there. prompts there. <laughs> Let's move on to the next prompt. All right. Abby's mom doesn't believe Sia has autism. I saw it in her face. I'm calling it out. It's, it's very complicated, very nuanced. Everyone, look, for every trans person that exists, there's Blair White. And there's somebody else. I can't think of another trans person for some reason. I'm blanking. I'm so tired. I'm just saying, for every, okay, for every, there's a hmm. And that's why like no one can be ever fully represented, right? It's better for autistic people to date within the community. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I might, I might it's better just for autistic pop people to date within the community. Interesting. <laughs> you hesitated. I'm curious if you want to start. I hesitated because I, that's such a superficial thing to look, I mean, like, and just, and the basis of it. Like, I don't want to just be with somebody just because they're autistic, but, you know, it's, it's good to find commonality. I will say neurodivergent with neurodivergent is really great. Um, you know what I mean? I will say that I don't think I could have ended up with a neurotypical person. I just don't think they would have been understanding in the same way, though I know it's possible. And I've seen that work with people. I don't think I, Brittany, could have been with a neurotypical person. Yeah, I think my marriage is very successful because he's neurodivergent and incredibly on top of it and incredibly aware of how many layers go into our everyday life. And he's incredibly compassionate and thoughtful. And somewhat. Or I could imagine myself with a neurodivergent person who's like, I'm like better than other neurodivergent people. Like I couldn't end up with a neurodivergent person who was like ashamed of medication or ashamed of therapy or ashamed of not being strong enough. Or like I need a person that's like, oh yeah, we're neurodivergent. Oh. We have to remember to shower today. <laughs> I need a neurodivergent person that's just like, yeah, life is hard. Let's remember to like brush our teeth and eat food versus somebody else, somebody else who's like, oh my God, bro. Like you have to like remember to shower. I'm like, yeah, bro. You have to like remember to get it in sometimes. Not me. I love showers. Well, sometimes like sometimes I forget to do other things. You guys know. You guys know. But like I just like, yeah, like I have to be reminded to take my fucking pills every day. Okay. Like I take vitamins every day and I literally for so, like, can't fucking remember to take them. Okay. But it's like, okay, you just need to like, little. anyways, a neurotypical person would probably get really exhausted. I'm assuming I could be wrong. Obviously I know lots of great couples who are neurotypical, neurotypical, neurodivergent dating. I don't want to be misunderstood. I just, for me, Brittany is a consciousness. I think I'd get, I'd be a lot. And I think autism is a huge part of my identity and how I see the and how we see the world and just like I personally don't look for I mean granted I've never been in a relationship and I think me being autistic and not trusting guys in particular is something that I struggle with but I can see how it is better because it's easy just to because that autistic person might be able to like see you like like at just even sitting here just talking about our experiences like you can say something and I can see you in that moment and it feels good but ultimately mm. I don't think it's the end all be all. So okay, I just want to say 
Wolf, you said like if you worry constantly about everything, you most likely have generalized anxiety disorder. It's not rocket science. Or if you're constantly sad, you're most likely depressed. But that's not the answering the why. This is where my brain and your brain deviate. You're not actually answering the why. Why are you depressed? Because nobody cares that you're depressed. We care why you're depressed. That's not the diagnosis you're looking for. Oh my God, I just have anxiety and depression. Why? So getting, you can't just like guess. You need to go further, at least with like my form of therapy. I like I needed DBT or I needed to do parts of DBT or I needed a therapist who knew what she was doing. Like, again, like, yes, you can make a guess that your knee is broken, but then you have to figure out like, why is my knee broken? How do I fix my knee? You need to go to somebody. Getting a diagnosis also gets you access to doctors that will give you medication or help you go to group therapy or solo therapy. So like self-diagnosis doesn't offer you the backing of paperwork. It doesn't offer you the benefit of now your doctors know what to do or now you can go to a specialist or it disadvantages you and actually is a negative it's on your paperwork. So yeah, it's not rocket science to guess what you have. But it also is a very complicated thing. I don't, I do get a little annoyed when people who aren't like medically educated get it into their heads so they can like understand medical stuff because I feel like that is not probably true. It's certainly not for me. Like I don't want to teach DBT. Sometimes people are like, Brittany, can you teach DBT? No, I'm not a therapist. I'm just a patient. Like asking a random YouTuber to teach you DBT, I think it's like, don't do that. They don't fucking know. You need to go to a, a professional. You know what I mean? So again, like there are so many other things that come into play. So then you have to know why. And then you have to go and figure it out. And then you have, like not everyone's brain works the same. You know what I mean? You're making it sound like it's really simple to figure out, but you can't even figure out that what you're saying is very specific to you. Like you're not even saying something that's even obviously clear to 99% of the people on the planet. So Abby, you wanna talk about dating David or who's on the spectrum? David, my boyfriend, is also on the autism spectrum. David, we love David. And we like to go tra go, go to like the Century City Mall independent. Also, who pays for their lifestyle? David and Abby, I assume, have parents who pay for their lifestyle, like traveling to Africa. So like, who's paying for their lifestyle? And our David and Abby, what are they going to do after they all die? Definitely sometimes. And what's great about David that he understands the way my mind works. He understands my autism. And we just went to the zoo yesterday. Fun. <laughs> For her autism, dating someone within the autism community is right. And David understands her autism. Just the other night. Um, Abby just said that. We had a big um, dinner in a restaurant and there was a crying baby right next to our table. What did David do for you? He covered my ears, and in some ways that, that baby actually really liked me. When he was crying, <laughs> he was a lot, you know who he reminded me of? Curious George. Yes. <laughs> oh my God, that's so cute though. How considerate, how thoughtful David is. <laughs> we, we, the little we, monkey. We, we, and his we, mother reminded me of the man with the yellow hat. I know. She's great with the analogies, right? But but what was great is that when she started to have a meltdown and a, and a you know, real anxiety attack because of that screaming baby, that auditory sound, they wouldn't change tables. We asked to change our table. The restaurant wouldn't do it. It's just one of those unfortunate scenes. Family was really nice. It was just unfortunate. David leaned over and covered her ears and let her experience that. And I'm not sure a typical person would get that or understand that or have patience for that. And that happens, by the way, a lot. Would you feel uncomfortable having a neurotypical person date, Abby? Um, candidly speaking, I guess I kind of would. Because the innocence, um, oh, oh, what did I say? What did I say? She needs an aide to help her, always. Uh, we're still learning life skills. I don't understand how a typical person might be able to have that level of patience. I'm not saying it's not possible, but I just think in general, um, and what I've witnessed between David and Abby is, is like literally makes me cry, tears of joy. It's See, you gotta date somebody on your level. Like I said, I, and I did feel this way, and I know we talked about it with Love on the Spectrum, about that innocence and that thing. I do think I feel the same way about certain people like I do with age. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like if I dated a 19-year-old, it would be so inappropriate. Like, if I dated somebody with a huge age gap, it would be so inappropriate. Like, I just know so much more than you. There's no way you're as smart as me, and there's no way you have lived experience like me. 
It's like the red flag. It feels the same way. I don't think, uh, first, I'm not insulted at the word innocent or naive. Like I said, I, a lot of my siblings are very innocent and naive, right? Because of the bubbles they're in, because of what they experience in the world, because of how curious they are, because of what they know about. You know what I mean? Remember that we're on the internet, guys, and we're chronically in spaces without supervision that talk about things that normal people aren't talking about. Like we talked about Lolly yesterday. Imagine Abby learning about Lolly and being thrown in her face all of this Lolly porn. It's like, it might totally shock her nervous system because she's like, what the fuck? A normal, like a normal, regular, middle-aged person could feel the same exact way, neurotypical person could feel the same way about saying Lolly. They would be considered naive to me or kind of innocent. Like when I see old people who don't know about stuff, I'm like, oh, you're kind of innocent. And I do think you can take advantage of older people depending on like if you're 35 and like it's a 70 year old who doesn't know what's going on in the world or like if you're autistic in a way that doesn't expose you to certain things or you lived a sheltered life or if you're 19 and I just feel like it's more nuanced it just depends on the people I do think Abby could possibly be taken she doesn't seem very street smart if she just starts saying fuck for the first time in her life she's not street smart and street smarts people are in it if you're not street smart you're innocent that's kind of my world belief you know what I mean? I just think like innocence and naivety are the same thing to my brain. What do you guys think? You know what I mean? I think we also take for granted how degenerate we are. So we think everyone else is, but the world can be pretty innocent. My farm brother who has children and makes very good money didn't know what the dark web was until a couple years ago. The dark web. The dark web. Do you get what I'm saying? The dark web. To us, it's like, what do you mean? It's the dark web, right? Everybody knows what that is. No. So I just feel like Abby is innocent. Everything she displays here, she needs a caretaker. She can't live away from her parents. David is also innocent. David is also innocent. That's why David and Abby match, because they're the same level. They're peers. They are. You want some fuckboy freshman in college to come Dave Abby? Are you saying you want some fuckboy, neurotypical guy to be like, yo, what's up, Abby? <laughs> What's up, Abby? I'm going to take you to fucking uh, the pier, bro. We're going to go to the beach, bro. <laughs> What's up, Abby? Don't fuck with me, bro. You know for a fact David would never pressure Abby into sex. You know for a fact some neurotypical boy would absolutely possibly do that to Abby. Why are we pretending over here? Like, I don't know why we're all playing this game right now. I refuse to believe it. Most beautiful thing ever. I've never been in a relationship either, and I 100% am would love to date someone else on the spectrum. I, I definitely think that there would be a lot of beautiful connection there. However, there really is something beautiful about... Okay, hold on here. Just Joe said, it's interesting the way your life could go in some way. Abby is doing better than me. She's more successful and has a partner. She's more successful because she has a mother and she has a partner because she was on a show that her mother put her on. And that relationship is contingent on both of their parents being alive because neither of them, as far as I know, work or hold down a job. So remember that their life is only successful because the people around them are caretaking for them. So like they're not independent people. They're interdependent, which is good. It's good that they have families that care about them. But as far as I know, David and Abby are completely reliant in many ways on their families and their families are doing everything they can now to give them the money they need. And David has siblings and Abby is a sibling that will probably take care of them. So this is good stuff, but they are, they are reliant on their communities, which is good that they have good communities. I would love to take care of one of my siblings if they needed something. I already think about it now and my siblings, you know what I mean? Whether it's the autist one or the ADHD one or whatever, like I hope that I can in some ways support the siblings if they need anything, right? So again, like remember like you're watching somebody who's having a very specific lived experience. Oh, my light died. R.I.P. light. R.I.P. A neurotypical person who just gives a crap. I'm personally no less attracted to. Also, lots of neurotyp neurotypical people are virginal, not dating, never been in relationships. So just keep that in mind. To, uh, autistic people than I am to neurotypical people. Uh, but, but man, I'd be lying if I said I did not want. I'd be lying if I said I did not only want to date someone on the spectrum. I actually do agree with what y'all was saying earlier. Like, I do see where y'all coming from about having someone on the spectrum date with someone on the spectrum just would lead less pro 
it will bring less problems, but it just depends on the person, I guess, because I know me, because I can relate with Ian. I just said I'm pansexual, and mm. unfortunately, some people who I had feelings for, I had to try to find many reasons not to have feelings for them, especially at work, because <laughs> they are, <laughs> because Story I, of my wife. <laughs> I don't, yeah, no, because I just, I hate it, because it's, it's just weird and inappropriate for me. Oh. But anywho, and I just think people on a spectrum should be able to make a choice if it's safe to do so, because yeah. we are living in a garden of evil and we do have <laughs> we do have unfortunate people that will manipulate those of us whether we still have our innocence or not what about you what's I, your dating life like I'm, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm totally kidding so i'm 16. <laughs> oh, there you go. um chris is neurotypical chris this person is neurotypical are we being lied to why are the neurotypicals on this like don't feel neurotypical what what? This person is neurotypical? Are, what? Who? Huh? What? Who? You obviously should be aware that, you know, sometimes people will prey on those who they think they can manipulate, uh, even in neurotypical relationships. But at the same time, I don't think that anyone, kind of regardless of uh, who they are, should close themselves off to someone sto solely based on, like, a group that they're a part of or a stereotype, mm -hmm. right? That and so I agree with. That I think I that we with. should treat everyone as individuals and look at as such. And so maybe we should be kind of open to uh, whatever comes our way. Exactly. Let me put it this way. The autism label should not be the reason why a, neur a neurotypical person would not want to date someone on the spectrum. Uh, I disagree with this. Because again, only if it's about them, but it's always about people. Like I always say, I'd be a horrible partner to somebody with an eating disorder. So if somebody I like liked had an eating disorder, like I'm going to be real with you, I'd be a really bad partner to that partner. I'm almost positive. I've never dated anyone with an eating disorder, but I'm almost positive I'd be horrible for them. It's like sometimes people can't fucking handle it. And I do think it's better for people to say, I actually can't handle that. Because, like, you wouldn't want them to lie to you and, like, be with you. I don't know. Like, I disagree with that. And also, it depends on values. Like, so if somebody had neurodivergency, obviously, it wouldn't be a deal breaker for me. But it might be a deal breaker for me to date somebody who's, like, neurotypical in a way. But not really. I've just never really dated neurotypical people, to be fair. Yeah, political observances, I would be a terrible partner to a vegan. I think I would be a good partner to a vegan that's cool around meat. But a really bad partner to a person who was like anti-meat. It just depends. Like, again, I think it's about you. So I don't care. Like personally, if someone like, I would be a very bad partner to somebody in the military. I tried to date a military guy and I was like, man, I'm going to be a bad partner to you. It's not going to work. Like, it's going to make me crazy. I'm not going to be a good partner to you. Like, I'm not going to feel in a marriage. You're going to be away a long time. Like, it's not you're, you're really saying, I don't think I can do this. And I don't think people should have to work on being good at something. They wouldn't, again, I want you to play to your strength. And also like genetics are a thing. Maybe you don't want a kid with autism. Maybe you don't want a kid with some sort of like genetic disease. I just think you shouldn't have kids. But like, if you're gonna have kids, you know, maybe you're thinking about that or maybe, I'm just kidding, that's a joke. You should have kids if you want kids. I'm just kidding. The autism themselves, you know, you, you see what I mean? It's it's, yeah. it's hard to explain, you know, like the label can't get in the ways. If, if someone is like, oh, by the way, I have autism, and then they just immediately walk away just because of that, you know, then I think that that's a little bit of a problem. Yeah, but remember that the people who are being represented on this panel right now are saying that having autism is difficult. I feel ostracized from society. I have no friends. I've never dated anyone. You're not selling it. Now you're selling it to this crowd because we get it, but you're not selling it to a non nerd like to a neurotypical person who, who maybe doesn't relate to any of those things. Do you get what I'm saying? I'm assuming you're talking about a neurotypical person that's like very neurotypical. So groups of friends, social, job, no problem, no, you know, all that stuff. Like that's a very different world. But if you're talking about a neurodivergent person who's also very anxiety and very aware and very this, then absolutely. But I could understand a neurotypical person that's like, I don't want to deal with this. It's an extra step I don't want to deal with. And I'm like, okay, fair. Thank you for telling me. I'm so glad we didn't get married under a false pretense. You know what I mean?
but there's so much more that goes into this, obviously. Um, what's that girl's name? What's that comedian's name? Her husband has autism or is autistic. Uh, the one, the blonde lady, I don't know her name. Okay, like lots of people are on the spectrum of neurodivergent or neurotypical. They're always dating. That's not the problem. I think, I think there's just like a lot. I don't know. I don't think it's as black and white is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I think dating is probably a struggle for many people, and whether yes. it be neurotypical yeah. or no, yeah. that's, that's why I have respect for you. Yeah. It is. It's incredibly hard out here right now. Thoughtspot says there's a lot of contradictions for sure. For sure. Yeah. For fact, you're a single mom. You taking two kids full job. Like, I have total respect for you because my mom is in a similar boat. I completely have full respect for you, so I understand completely. <laughs> How did you go about, I guess, setting up that blind date? Is there like a way for? maybe autistic people to be able to date easier. Is well, there such it's interesting systems? because she was on Love on the Spectrum and so that was like a random thing that came from Australia to the US. And I'll be honest with you, even saying yes to doing that show, she didn't really know what it was. I didn't really know what it was, but then I saw Australia season one and it made me nervous because they were driving cars, college grads, they were going to Europe by themselves. And I was like, well, we don't have that. And there's a big expressive language issue. Mm -hmm. So I think you want, pardon the term, Asperger's in love. Mm -hmm. Because these folks have a different. Ooh, she's very old school. Ooh, she's very old school. Oh, that's why Abby's mom was pissing everybody off. Interesting. Interesting. You know, people without uh, autism, people who don't have autism also don't drive. So, just FYI, I'm going to put that out there. Um, interesting. So, she's more old school and she's pissing everybody off because of it. Is that what's, what, what I'm getting? Yeah, she has like um Okay, I think that's fair. She's right. Australian uh love on the spectrum was very different. It was very different. Different different levels, different like uh yeah, hmm care needs, uh low support needs compared to high. Interesting. Mm. Yeah, I get what Abby's mom means. Abby's mom is right. Look, guys, Ultimately, Abby's the perfect target for some gross porn company to convince this woman and all of her innocence to be put on a porn tape and she's going to regret it. Do you hear me? Abby is the perfect target for salacious men. She is the perfect target for gross like communities to take advantage of her. I think Abby's mom is right to protect Abby because I know it sounds kind of offensive to some of you. You need to get your fucking trauma under control. I'm telling you right now, Abby is exactly the person that people would take control of. She, like, Abby is exactly the person bad people would target. It's not all you fuckers and my degenerate audience. Okay, no offense. It's Abby's. And Abby's tape would sell millions, bro. Abby's tape is, oh my God, people would fucking pay for that shit. Because, say it with me, she's childlike. I'm sorry. Absolutely would sell. Okay? You know? So I'm just saying, as much as we get defensive, Abby's mom knows Abby's experience. And fucking people be perverts out here. There is no way Abby's not getting some sick DMs, bro. So, okay. Like, protect Abby. And recognize Abby's not everybody's needs level. And her mom knows that. But I do think the mom has some bias and trauma around less care. Let, well, what is it? Less support needs. Um, autistic. So she maybe needs to go to therapy for that. Just to say like, hey. You know what I mean? Like just to get some support for that, you know? Different skill set. And I didn't want her to be in over her head. She didn't care really one way or the other. So obviously it was a great thing we did, but I will say that the team, once they came over, was really, they were really kind about it. And they let her kind of be her and do her thing. And yeah, that's the rest right, because I couldn't sit, I couldn't focus and sit still. I needed my, right. I needed to be moving. During the interview. Yeah. Yeah. You anyway. made it through with flying colors. <laughs> Thank you. And, and flying colors means victoriously, by the way. Yes. Yeah. And, you're, and you're doing it here now. Yeah. Yes. Autism can be a strength. Okay, also, I recently saw... It's interesting. Everyone has a different diagnosis or sorry, different relationship with their diagnoses. Like um, some people feel like autism is a superpower. ADHD is a superpower. Um, I saw Destiny recently on the Ice Coffee Hour. I love the Ice Coffee Hour. He really resents this talking point from what I understand from his lived experience. I don't want to discredit that. But he feels like ADHD is not a fucking superpower. 
And I think that's really, really fair. You and I have talked about this before about like taking magical pills and hypotheticals and all that stuff. But I do think a lot of people have a mixed relationship with these things. So obviously, without the struggle, everything could feel like a superpower. The question is, is it worth the struggle? Then does it feel like a superpower? So, you know, I think there's something to that conversation that needs to be had. But that stood out to me that like, oh, like not everyone feels like very good about their diagnoses. And some people like feel like it's positive or feel like it's negative. And it just feels it's in relation to how much of a burden it feels like. Does that make sense? <laughs> Had to think about that, huh? Hmm. I don't know. I didn't want. To, I don't want to say it's a. Like, I know people say it's a superpower. I don't necessarily agree that it's a superpower. One of the reasons why, like, I write about autism appreciation. I like the question. Autism can be strength. That's interesting. Strength is a hard word for me. Strength. What do we think about that word? Strength. Hmm. Showing my son. Um, and I haven't really told the story of the reason why. When my son was first showing signs of delay and we were getting him diagnosed, it's all I thought about it was like, it's the worst thing in the world. Terrible things are going to happen. Terrible things are going to happen. As I was worrying about it being the worst thing in the world, I had a heart attack. And it turns out I needed a quintuple bypass. So I had a quintuple bypass. I was Damn. 35. Um, I had no idea. I had no health problems before that or anything. And I remember being in the hospital, and I didn't think about what he couldn't do. I didn't think about my worries. I just wanted to see him. I want to get my son back. And since that day, I've seen, I've tried to focus my entire life on positives, but especially when it comes to him, the positives that come with his autism. And the fact, as I said before, he's, he's true, he's honest, he's genuine, his soul is pure. The things that he does are for a good reason. And a lot of the things that I think sometimes I'm guilty of as somebody who's, you know, neurotypical, um, you know, selfish tendencies sometimes or conceit or arrogance, things like that. He doesn't have. What if Abby's mom has autism? It's genetic. Does her dad have autism? Did her uncles and aunties? I'm just saying, like, what if these people all have autism? I think sometimes parents see the struggle of their kids and never think that I could have that because I'm not struggling in the same way. Or like in the reverse, some parents who don't have it look at their kids and go like, you're struggling like everybody else. I don't want my kid to be different. Unless your kid is clearly different. Like if my parents had an autistic kid that was nonverbal, it would be very clear. But because their autistic kid isn't nonverbal, they refuse to ex like, mm -mm. like sometimes when I'm like, my parents are very like loving with like, they're very positive around people with disabilities and uniqueness like there's nothing wrong with that but unless it's very obvious kind of like abby's mom they just don't believe it you know what i mean like they my parents would be so loving to a kid with disabilities like clear disabilities but even my fibro it's very hard for them because I'm, they're not seeing it it's not visually there humans have a really hard time believing people like their internal like it, it's an invisible illness right fibro and like same, like sometimes like mental cognitive, I'm so tired. You know what I'm trying to say? It's amazing what people will do when it's obvious. And it's amazing how unintentionally lacking of compassion people will be when it's not obvious to them. And it's almost like the removal of those things are his strength. I actually agree. Like, like I see your point because I do think <sighs> autism is a strength. As you said, being autistic, it's like you have like, I guess in my my meaning, double the innocence versus how you would be when you're neurotypical. Because when I was in high school, <laughs> imagine all the crap I have to s eavesdrop on, and I'm just <laughs> like, yeah, I think I know how you're going to be growing up. But it's not all of them, any anyways. But the whole point though is, some of them do remind you the kind the times where those innocence is almost so valuable. Because, you know, you only want to have them once and sometimes, depending on what you do, you may get it partly and some days you may get it, but not the same way like you used to. So, yes. I'm a little, personally, I'm a little on the fence about the pure thing. I was called pure a lot uh, as a teenager. I, I don't, I don't, I just, I'm not totally sure how I feel about that, but I totally understand what you're saying. It's just the kind of autism. If they met the mean autists, they would never call them pure. Look. Nobody on Reddit who's a mean autist is a pure autist. It's a type of autism, energy you give off, wholesome, cute, pure. It's a spectrum. I'm telling you this right now. Nobody in this panel 
would even think about calling a mean... Can you imagine if the mean autists were here? They'd be like, <laughs> you're all retarded. It, fedora. Like, they'd be like, oh my god, you're so retarded. Fedora. Like, there's no fucking way these people wouldn't cry. They would have to kick them out of the group, but they'd still be autistic. Those are autistic people. The mean autists on Reddit are just as fucking autistic as these fuckers here. It's just these are the nice autists, and those are the mean autists. Do you get what I'm saying? It's all fucking autism. We deal with mean autists because we're on this space on the internet. I would prefer to work with nice autists because they're sweet and I like them better. But there's an innocence to nice people. Sweet people, kind people automatically give up the vibe of nice. You know? And so when you're a mean autist, I'm just saying, I'm dead fucking serious. I would love, I'm so sorry. It would be torture. <gasps> this is a good dating example. If a mean autist dated these people, they'd probably trigger the fuck out of their own meltdowns. But honestly, it'd be kind of interesting to see them all socialize together. It would. Can you imagine the incel autist being like, oh, Abby's a girl. She gets laid. She doesn't even, she's not even, she doesn't understand she's living life on easy mode, bro. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Can you imagine the incel autist coming in to talk to Abby? I'd be like, you leave her alone, bitch. You know, I'm just saying, like, it's all autism. Okay. The pure autist to the mean autist type pipeline. Exactly. Exactly. That's all I'm saying. I'm just saying. Okay. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. In every other way. And for me, it takes the form of autism is my superpower. Autism is my strength. Autism is something I have. It's not something that I am. Um, that's my relationship with it. And I will accommodate your relationships with your autism. Autism is not always a strength, though. Some of the most traumatic moments of my life have been sensory overloads, meltdowns uh, in public. So I think that that would be kind of ridiculous to call that a strength. Uh, but at the same time, autism is very much a strength in so many other ways. Um, for me, I ditto that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I will say, I. I'm slightly different in the sense of like, I identify as an autistic person rather than a person with autism because it's not something I need to otherize. And for me, I understand why other people would kind of, I, they have, everyone has their right to their preference. In terms of it being a strength, mm -hmm. I see it as a strength because frankly, I don't know who I would be without it. Because <laughs> for me- in That goes back to that personality conversation. Are you autistic and is that who you are? Or could you, if you took away the autism, would you be like a consciousness? Like that's that question. That's why some people think that if you're um, level one autist, it's it feels like it's a part of who you are. But if you're like a higher needs autist, it feels like something that's blocking you from being who you could be. So it's interesting. In terms of how to incorporate my autism to that, I use it as part of my arsenal. Not as like a crutch, but like just more as like a, I can do this because I, have this mixture of my autism and my upbringing and I kind of bring them two together because that's what I know. You can't simply look at autism as a deficit as opposed to a strength because that's basically saying part okay. of- Okay, same with Down syndrome though. Hannah says same with Down syndrome. Everyone wants to say everyone with Down syndrome is innocent and sweet and happy, but tell that to my neighbor that has called me fat and stupid more times than I can count. Damn! Damn, that'd be so funny. I'm so sorry. I would love to watch that. That'd be so funny. There is a spectrum with Down syndrome as well. Y'all think everyone's so innocent, but everyone is different. And some people with Down syndrome live completely fine on their own and work jobs. And some people with Down syndrome need care from family. It's different for all of us. And that's all I'm trying to say is like, we need to stop thinking, oh my God, it's not a monolith. Everyone is having a completely fucking different experience. Now the question is like Abby, let's think in categories. Which category do you fall into? Are you the mean autist on Reddit, bro? Are you the innocent autist? autist? Or are you like the sex positive furry autist who's also trans? I'm just saying there are a lot of ways to be autist because the personality that you are, I don't know if your autism dictates it's different for everybody, but like just because you're autistic doesn't mean you're a specific thing. But if you, who that person is, is a deficit. And, and that's not correct. And so it's better that we try and have this positive outlook on it instead of saying, hey, this person has a problem. It's, hey, this person is different. How can we help them or accept them? But see, in Abby's case, there is a deficit. 
And that's the difference. So that's why the spectrum and the language is confusing. Mm. If you have to learn to talk and you have to learn that the world is happening right here, because instead of saying, hey, this person. What the fuck just happened? And has a problem, it's, hey, this person is different. How can we help them or accept them? But see, in Abby's case, there is a deficit. And that's the. Ingrid, you're definitely not pure. Yes, ma'am, you're not. You're a heathen. You're degenerate. That's why you belong in my community, ma'am. See, Ingrid is not pure. She's a degenerate. That's why she's a part of this community. Abby, I don't want Abby in my community. She's going to, I don't, people are going to be, they're, she's so sweet, but she's going to get beat up. We're going to have to protect her, which is great. We would protect Abby. We'd love her here. We love Abby. But I just feel like Abby wouldn't even understand the memes, bro. She'd get fucking, it'd be like a, a hell mine for her. This is not, this space is not, this is a degenerate space. This is a de degen space, bro. This is, this is, she, okay. We love Abby. But I just feel like this space, I feel like we'd corrupt her. I feel like we'd ruin her life, girl. We'd introduce her to Vosh's stash and her whole life would be ruined. So that's why the spectrum and the language is confusing. Mm. If you have to learn to talk and you have to learn that the world is happening right here because some people come in so isolated, just shut down. And I wish that the industry would change the language so that those that have overcome deficit are honored and those that have just a difference are honored. Do you see why the language and the confusion and new diagnostic things, it's all sort of blurred lines until we get. Yeah, I think she's got trauma over, um, uh, she's got trauma over the spectrum, but also, yeah, over the new diagnosis. Yeah, she should, I get it, I get it. She's really struggled. I think she should go to therapy for this. I think you guys need to stop being discompassionate to her. All those people that aren't compassionate with her are forgetting she's traumatized. Imagine having a baby that is just so wonderful and your baby grows up and even into adulthood, the struggle is real. The financial burden has been real. Like she's a single mom. So I, you know, just remember like this has not been easy for Abby's mom. Okay. Abby's mom be living a life that is struggle. So I totally understand this, bro. You know, Livy says, I wonder the overlap between autism and the BDSM King community. Oh girl, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. I just think sometimes we forget like how our parents are impacted by these things. But also, like I said, this is a degen space. I love this space. But y'all, not everybody can make it here, okay? You got to be tough. You got to be, you got to be ready. You know what I mean? You got to be ready. So, man. Mm. <gasps> Raider says, I said it earlier in the stream, but Vaj is making a response video. We definitely need to watch that if you're down. I, not tonight, but maybe tomorrow, guys. This clear and it's, it's to me, the biggest problem. Hey, Abby, I want to ask you a question. What do you, what do you think your strengths are? Hmm, my strengths are, um, Singing, um, swimming. I can see things before anyone else. I can remember things. I can hear things far away in the distance. Yeah, no, it's very, very important that. Those are good strengths. Yeah, just think about those answers. Those are good answers. But just think about that. We all acknowledge the fact that everybody, whether we're on the spectrum or not, has strengths and weaknesses, uh, things that make us uh, unique. Um, just because the weaknesses or deficits, if you will, might seem a bit more outlandish or might be things that um, an overwhelming majority of society does not struggle with doesn't mean that 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 unique struggle is any less valid. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that it's wonderful to get to talk to everyone. <laughs> and I'm really glad to be able to hear about all your experiences because I didn't know a lot of like the experiences that you guys have had. I'm really glad I was able to understand those and learn those too. So to conclude it, uh, I know you were recently on American Idol. Um, <laughs> yes. We would love to hear you sing. <gasps> oh, well, before I sing. On the spot? <laughs> <laughs> um, Go stream my brand new EP, Regroup. I've worked wow. with some absolutely incredible people, including my drummer, Logan Shepard. Shout out to you, man. Wow. He's also this, on the spectrum. This is a bold man right here, bro. He bold. He just shouting shit out, bro. He's like, yo, follow me. Follow my, follow, follow this guy. Follow this blog over here. He bold, bro. And as a tour. See, this, I can't tell. Is this autism? Because he's just like saying what he wants to say. Or is this the fact that he's so socially competent that he's like, yo, shout out drummer it anything is possible like is this inappropriate for him to be shouting shit out i can't tell but i love it and uh you are the best that will never be oh in God. my life in my life <laughs> whoa what about me
No, oh, your no. turn. Yes. I have, you know, Taylor Swift. The oh, I love singer. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, she's great. She's amazing. Um, <laughs> I have this thing where I get older, but just never wiser. Midnights become my afternoons. <laughs> if you guys want to hug, shake it out. Yeah. 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 I'm glad we watched it. I'm glad ThoughtSpot was in the chat. I love her so much. Please go check out her content. She's so talented and wonderful. And I just like really love the content. And I'm trying to think. Um, my closing thoughts, I think, are this. That asking the world that's so full of diversity to represent you is like the ocean asking the world to notice that it's billions of drops of water and not just one big ocean. I think sometimes we need to be more self-aware of what we're requesting from people, the universe and ourselves, especially ourselves, especially if you're neurodivergent or a little bit different in your social group, you're gonna put so much more pressure on yourself than the people who are more in the middle, you know what I mean? I think we need to be reasonable and kind. I think that would be very helpful. And I just think it's more logical, bros. It's just more efficient. Let's just be more efficient. You know, I just feel like it's more efficient. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool